I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections. Will the Secretary please take the roll? Assemblyman DeLong? Present. Assemblywoman Dickman? Here. Assemblyman De Silva? Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Assemblywoman Hibbit? Assemblyman Hibbits? Here. Assemblyman MacArthur? Here. Assemblywoman Brittany Miller? Here. Assemblyman Cameron Miller? Assemblyman Monroe Marino. Assemblyman Assemblywoman Newby. Here. Assemblyman Yeager. Here. Chair Gorlo. And I'm here. Thank you very much. Please mark Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno absent excused and Assemblywoman Gonzalez present when she arrives. Welcome everybody to Carson City. And I see we see have some people in Las Vegas today. And of course, anyone that's on the internet as well. Today we'll be hearing Assembly Bill 286 and Assembly Joint Resolution 5. I want to kind of um, go ahead before, excuse me, please have a seat. <laughs> um, just kind of be prepared for anyone who may be calling in testimony later on. That number is 888-475-4499. And the meeting ID, bless you. The meeting ID is 8421-575-0805. So again, that's 888-475-4499, meeting ID 842-157-50805, and then you'll press the pound sign. Friendly reminder to everybody to please silence your electronics. I'd like to check mine too. If you do wish to testify for either of our agenda items, you'll want to sign in at the table in the front. And then when you come to the table, make sure you turn your microphone on and please speak and spell your name slowly for the record. There are hard copies at the table of today's meeting. We do expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting, even if we may not agree with one another's positions. Committee members will be using their laptops to view handouts and other documents, so please do not take that as a sign of disrespect or inattention. And public comment will be taken at the end of the meeting. And with that, we will get started. Welcome, Assemblywoman Miller. Please um, begin when you're ready. Thank you so much, Chair Gorlo. Uh, good afternoon to Chair Gorlo and to all the committee members that are here right now and to everyone else watching here in Carson City or in Grant Sawyer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to present Assembly Bill 286 to you today. <laughs> This measure expands access to the voting process for individuals in the custody of a county or city jail. Our democracy is strongest when every voter can participate in the electoral process. However, for a long time now, it's been difficult for certain groups of voters, specifically those in custody of a county or city jail. But before I go any further, let me first explain the particularly important distinction between jail and prison. I say this because I know that we use these terms synonymously, but they are in fact quite different. Prison is where those convict convicted of a felony will serve out their sentence, and that sentence can be anywhere from one year to life without parole, meaning they will never leave prison. On the other hand, jail is a temporary place where people in custody are awaiting trial. According to the Prison Policy Initiative, approximately two out of every three people in United States in United States jails are awaiting trial and have not been convicted. Thus, they still have the right to vote. Additionally, some may never be convicted of a crime as the case may be dismissed or they stand trial and they are acquitted. Others are serving time for misdemeanor offenses, which is less than one year, which in Nevada and 43 other states does not impact their voter eligibility status. Nevada only prohibits persons convicted of a felony from voted from voting unless their right has been restored pursuant to NRS 213.157. Even though jail is temporary and may never even result in conviction, these individuals are in, custody, are in custody, meaning they cannot leave the facility to vote at a polling place. They often do not have the necessary information for registering to vote or access to their mail ballot that would have otherwise been delivered to their home. To be clear, this bill does not authorize any person who by law is ineligible to vote or to register to vote to do so. It does not authorize a person convicted of a felony to vote in prison. 
Additionally, the bill does not revise any of the provisions governing the qualifications for voting or registering to vote in this state. Assembly Bill 286 simply expands access to the voting process to Nevadans who are legally entitled to vote or to register to vote, but who are detained in a county or city jail. These individuals still have a constitutional right to participate in the electoral process, and we need to make sure they have sufficient, ex sufficient access to exercise that right. The bill ensures that individuals will have access to voting during early vote for all primary, special, and general elections, as well as election day. Depending on the capabilities of each individual county or city jail, individuals may register and or vote through the Secretary of State's approved electronic transmission system for elections. If the facility does not have the capacity, then absentee ballots will be provided to and utilized by the elector. Now first, as I go through the bill, I will be working through the conceptual amendments. And I'm not able to reference specific section numbers and such because the conceptual amendments will dramatically change those section numbers. The amendments, of course, once this is adopted, actually codify many of the activities that are currently occurring here in our Nevada County and city jails. What this bill really seeks to do is to provide consistency of a, cons of a secured voting infrastructure. So per the amendment, the first, the first change you will see is that sections two through four are deleted. And that's a, a major change because the intention of this bill was never to make the county or city jail of a polling place. So a polling place in the traditional sense where everyone from the community would be welcome to come. And of course, there's other restrictions that occur with a polling place. It also, by deleting sections two through four, eliminates any juvenile detention or treatment centers. Deleting section 5.3 also removes where the bill language that says that voting booths will be installed within the jails. Another change is replacing mail ballots with absentee ballots. We've worked extensively with corrections and law enforcement and of course appreciate that in a jail there are still specific security measures that must be maintained in order to keep everyone safe, including those who are in custody and of course those who work there. And so because of the additional added burden for the scrutiny of mail ballots that may be delivered at home, we are not going to have those brought into the jail. However, we will have the ability through coordination working with our registrar's office that if someone requests an absentee ballot could be delivered to the jail for them. Sections 5.2 and B have been deleted, but what remains provides individuals in custody of a county or city jail who are eligible to register or to register to vote the same time frame as Nevadans who both, for both registering and voting on election day, as well as all the other time frames during early vote. Simply put, I should say same day registration. In addition to voting on election day, the, the existing section six of the bill authorizes eligible individuals in custody to vote or to register in custody to vote or register to vote through the Secretary of State's system of approved electronic transmission known as the Effective Absentee System for Elections, or EASE as we refer to it. EASE is currently provided to our military and overseas voters who use the system to register to vote, request a ballot, and then electronically transmit their ballot back to their local election office for processing. In 2021, the use of ease was expanded to voters with disabilities so that they may cast their vote privately and independently. Assembly Bill 286 would further expand the use of ease to those in county and city jails. In the instance that someone would like to register to vote, they may either request their ID if it's being held within the facility or a family member may bring it in for the purpose of registry. Assembly Bill 286 also expands access to absentee ballot voting for individuals in county and city jails, but the jail must allow the elector to complete the ballot with a reasonable amount of privacy and staff, and staff may not open the absentee ballot once it is voted and sealed by the elector. If a county clerk has established a 
a drop-off box for the ballots at the jail as authorized by the bill, the elector may return his or her ballot in that box. The city or county jail will coordinate with the registers on when and how it will be picked up or delivered. Either way, a chain of custody form will be completed to document the security of the ballots. This reassures the elector as well as protects the staff from any accusations. These forms are currently being utilized. Finally, Assembly Bill 286 imposes certain reporting requirements on the jails so that the Secretary of State has information on the processes used to comply with the requirements of the bill and a summary of any complaints received from individuals relating to voting or registering to vote at the facilities. Ultimately, Assembly Bill 286 will require each county or city jail to develop a consistent infrastructure to allow those who are eligible to register to vote or vote the ability to do so by the e-system or through absentee ballot or paper registration form. Part of the process includes coordination with county registrars and ensuring that this process and necessary voting information, which is election information on candidates and statewide measures to be voted upon, is provided. As well as that the county or city jail includes updated information on this process and procedure of the voting or registration process in the inmate handbook. Assembly Bill 286 requires a relative amount of privacy as the elector casts their vote and protects them from any threat, retribution, or intimidation for requesting or exercising their right to vote. There will be no electioneering or campaigning in the county or city jail. Again, this legislation brought forward is to ensure that those awaiting trial can exercise their constitutional right to vote. That we as Nevadans preserve the sentiment of innocent until proven guilty recognizing that some may never be convicted. We are simply ensuring that eligible electors have the ability to vote in the same early, special, primary, or general elections that they would have had the opportunity to, be, to vote in had they not been temporarily incarcerated. And of course, capable to go to the ballot box, to the polling place, or mail in their ballots themselves. Chair Gorlo and members of the committee, this concludes my presentation. I thank you for the opportunity for me to present this measure and hope that you join me in supporting this bill. With that, I am available for questions. Thank you very much, Assemblywoman Miller. All right, committee members, any questions? All right, please go ahead, Assemblyman Hibbets. Thank you, Chair. I never get to go first. Um, so my question is, you may or may not be aware that certain prisoners of various institutions are sometimes shipped out of the state for their own protection and various other reasons, but they are citizens of Nevada. They are technically our residents. How would we go about providing them the opportunity, the same opportunity as everybody else, to exercise that right? You know, I really appreciate that question, Assemblyman, because Please remember to state your name. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Assemblywoman Brittany Miller for the record and will be for the record of, for the time being. Um, I appreciate that question because I actually do, do not have the exact data on that. Again, there are many states that allow people to vote in jail and many that do not. And so it becomes a different question when we're go going through different states if a Nevada resident is in a, another state's jail. And so with that, I would, um, I need to research that and can get back to you, but I think that's a grand consideration. We know how we can handle it. We do have it in the bill for it, within different counties, but I appreciate that question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. You're very welcome. Next, we'll go to Speaker Yeager. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman, for presenting this. Um, you know, I've gotten a fair amount of communications on this email, and I like to just uh, try to get some clarification on the record about what the bill does and what it doesn't do. Um, so I just wanted to make sure there's, there's nothing in the bill or the amendment that you presented that would allow someone who is otherwise ineligible to vote um, under the laws of the state of Nevada from voting. Thank you, Speaker. That is correct. Nothing in this bill or the amendment changes anything about the eligibility of who is able to register to vote or to vote. So all of that that remains in our um, state laws and United States laws stays intact. These are 
eligible um, electors who just otherwise would be able to go to a polling place or send back their mail-in ballot. Thank you. And then could I just make a comment, Madam Chair? Not, not really a question, but um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone in this room, but I used to practice criminal defense um, at the public defender's office. And so um, I would often visit clients at the Clark County Detention Center or the local city jails and um, you know, just maybe to clear up some, some misconceptions, sometimes there's a belief that, well, if you're there, you've been sentenced for something, you're going to be there a long time. Um, it was not unusual at all to go see a client and then three days later they would be released when they first had, um, you know, a bail hearing uh, or they would get credit for time served. Sometimes the case would be dismissed, would be declined for prosecution. So I guess in my mind thinking about this, it always struck me that in some ways it's kind of random that you may end up there on the particular day that the polls are open. And and so I just appreciate um, your willingness to, to try to find a way to protect the right to vote, uh, which is in the Constitution. We'll remind folks of that. Um, and so not a, not a question there, but just an observation that um, not all these people will be convicted, um, even of misdemeanors. Um, a lot of them get out, and so I just appreciate the effort and the thoughtfulness that you've done to make sure that all of our voters in the state can actually cast their ballot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, next we'll go to Assemblywoman um, Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Assemblywoman um, Miller, for bringing this. I think it um, as speaker said, brings together two bedrock values. One is the right to vote, and the other is that you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Um, my question is more on the implementation and what it looks like on the ground. So we're talking about in AB 286, the day of the election or the primary or the presidential preference. And so inevitably there's going to be some inmates who were there prior to that that we can plan for and ask if they want to vote, but inevitably there are going to be some who come in the night before. Um, have you had any discussions with uh, the local clerks on how they're going to handle that and if there's going to be a cutoff date at which uh, they just can't get that ballot in for them? How is that going to go? That's a great question. Thank you, Assemblywoman Newby. What we've sought to do with this legislation is to leave it open and flexible so that those types of technical processes can be determined by each individual local, or I'm sorry, county or city jail and their county registrars. Because again, every jail operates somewhat differently. Obviously a jail in Clark County operates differently than a jail in Elko. And so as long as it's within the current state law parameters, it's about giving them the ability to work together to develop the process that works well for their situation. Uh, the nice thing about it being localized between individual jails and registrars is that they know their communities the best. Right? So again, those considerations that may need to be given to Elko as opposed to Clark County are available. And again, this is one thing that many people don't realize is that this is actually already occurring. Clark County, Washoe County, some of our smaller counties, that they have already been assisting individuals with voting while in jail. What's important about this bill is to codify that and to make it more uh, streamlined. Because again, right now it's because of the leadership that's in certain areas. But we know leadership changes and there's the possibility that someone else may came, come in and choose not to um, assist people. So at this point, it, it's really about them working together to come up with their procedures. Okay, thank you very much. We now have a question from Assemblywoman Dickman. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's kind of um, amazing that you answered my question before I even asked it just now. <laughs> I was gonna ask you if you knew how many do it, but I guess that really doesn't matter. But my question would be, how much of an unfunded mandate will this be? I, I know with the amendment, it's not gonna be anywhere near what it was gonna be, but 
do you have any idea at this point? Because I know there's no fiscal notes, but. Well, Assemblywoman Dickman, I love exercising, exercising the ability to say that this is not a funding committee and this is a policy <laughs> committee so that I'm not concerned with that right now. But okay. I agree with you that I, I know the concern with before the way that the bill originally was written, but that was also a major concern in writing this, that with working together, the idea is not to require more staffing, more funding, uh, those types of issues onto our jails or counties, but to just kind of, again, streamline what's already occurring. So hopefully with that, I'll be going back to discuss with everyone that now based on the amendment, the removal of any fiscal notes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. You're very welcome. Do we have any other questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. We will then open up testimony and support. So if anyone would like to come to the table in support of Assembly Bill 286. I'd, yeah. Each person will have two minutes. And just to kind of point out, we will have little cards to let you know when you're down to 30 seconds and then when you're done with your two minutes. So. Whoever would like to start, begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, Chair Gorlow and committee members. Um, Police Detective Adrian Hunt, representing Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We're in support of AB 286 and the proposed amendment. We want to show our gratitude for the hard work from Assemblywoman Miller working with all stakeholders bringing this bill to fruition. We appreciate Assemblywoman Miller for bringing this bill forward AB 286 will help ensure all citizens of Nevada who are eligible and allowed to exercise their constitutional right to vote. Thank you. Good afternoon for the record. My name is Emily Prasad Zamora, P-E-R-S-A-U-D hyphen Z-A-M-O-R-A, -A, and I'm the Executive Director of Silver State Voices, which leads the Nevadans Vote Coalition, and today we're in very strong support of AB 286. First, we'd like to thank Assemblywoman Miller for sponsoring this legislation and in all the work she's done to ensure that we've gotten to this place. This is an incredibly important policy, and the impact it will have on community members cannot be emphasized enough. Nevada voters retain their constitutional right to the ballot box no matter where they might be during an election. Out-of-state voters can request a mail ballot to be sent to a new address, and military and overseas voters can use the e-system for voting. Eligible voters detained in jail who are awaiting trial and have not yet been convicted should not be any different. We believe that every voter in jail should not only have access to their constitutional right, but should also be made aware of it. AB 286 addresses this gap. Should a jail choose to, using Nevada's Ease program, um, it is a safe and secure method of voting. Nevada's military, overseas, and disability communities have been using it for years. For us, AB 286 is about ensuring that as many eligible voters exercise, exercise their constitutional right to our democratic process, no matter where they are during early voting or on election day. We urge the committee to support AB 286. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Madam Chair, member of the committee, Doug Goodman, D-O-U-G-G-O-O-D-M-A-N, founder, executive director of Nevadans for Election Reform. Uh, Assemblywoman Miller, in her opening remarks, basically said everything I was going to say. So I'm going to keep this very short. I think we all agree that every eligible voter is, should have their right to cast their ballot. AB 286 does that, and so I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead when you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Gordlow and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Greg Herrera, H-E-R-R-E-R-A representing the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association and the Washoe County Sheriff's Office. We're in support of Assembly Bill 286 as amended and would like to thank Assemblywoman Miller for working with us on this bill and taking, taking into account processes already in place, safety and security concerns, and varying, lev varying levels of technological and staffing challenges throughout the state. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman, members of the committee, uh, my name is Gabriel DeCara. I am the Chief Deputy Secretary of State. I am here testifying in support on behalf of Secretary Francisco Aguilar. 
Um, the secretary is very, very fond of saying and reminding everyone in earshot, the right to vote is a constitutional right. It is a fundamental right, and it should be extended to every eligible voter wherever possible. Um, that includes individuals who are incarcerated but may not have been convicted of any crime. Secretary Aguilar is proud that his staff was able to work with Assemblywoman Miller and find a way to securely, affordably, and easily ensure that there are no barriers to that fundamental right. Um, county staff are comfortable and familiar with the ease system after a, a decade of utilizing it effectively. Based on these facts, Secretary Aguilar is in support of this legislation. He would like to thank Assemblywoman Miller for bringing the bill and this committee for hearing it. Thank you very much. Greens, <coughs> Greens Committee, my name is Torres Brenner. I'm a resident of North Las Vegas. And I am a complete supporter of Assembly Bill 2286, and I appreciate Assemblywoman Brittany Miller for bringing this bill to hope in life. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here from North Las Vegas. Appreciate you. <laughs> Please go ahead when you're ready. Uh, greetings. My name is Jagada Chambers, J-A-G-A-D-A-C-H-A-M-B-E-R-S. I'm actually the Rights Restoration Coordinator for Silver State Voices. Um, just here in complete support of this piece of legislation, um, have been invested with um, Assembly Miller and just am totally blown away at how... Um, driven, I would say, she has been in getting this to fruition. I know even getting um, a bill number is a big deal in our state with this short period of time. So I would just commend the folks for uh, intently listening and paying attention to her presentation and I would just urge all of you all support for the legislation. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin when you're ready. Hey, hello. My name is Jovan Jackson. I am formerly incarcerated and I reside in Assembly District 4. I'm in support of AB 286. Um, voting is one of the most important parts of a democracy and that American democracy should be present in our jails. Uh, please support AB 286. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Either one of you, I don't care. Thank you. Hello, my name is Susie Martinez. I am the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Nevada State AFL-CIO. And on behalf of over 150,000 members and 120 unions, we are in full support of the bill. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Leslie Turner. I am uh, the co-director of the Mass Liberation Project Nevada. I'm up here from Las Vegas. And <clears throat> I'm obviously in support of the bill. And I just want to thank Assemblywoman Miller for bringing this bill, getting all of the people to sign on to it and support it, but also highlighting the fact that this is already happening. Uh, we've already done it. We've uh, worked with directly with CCDC when it was under the jurisdiction of uh, now Governor Lombardo. We uh, went in the jail, we educated folks on how this works, and we coordinated ballots out of uh, CCDC and also Henderson Jail. So again, this is already happening. We did that back in 2018, um, so this is just about codifying it now and streamlining it and making sure that access is given to everybody in the state. And, and, and also it's flexible so that jurisdictions can create their own policies and make it make sense for that particular jurisdiction. So thank you. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. My name is Nick Shepak, S-H-E-P-A-C-K. I am the State Deputy Director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center. We're an organization that works at addressing issues with fines and fees in the criminal legal system. Part of the population we work with are individuals who end up spending time in jail for failure to pay, usually because they do not have an ability to pay their fines and fees. We also work with individuals who are uh, stuck in jail because they do not have the financial resources to pay their bail. We do not believe that poverty should be a barrier to democracy, and so we are in full support of this bill, and we hope you do the same. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee, Erica Roth, E-R-I-C-A-R-O-T-H, on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. I want to thank the Assemblywoman uh, for bringing this bill forward. It brings um, to light two of my favorite constitutional rights, the right to vote and the presumption of innocence. Um, a person does not shed those rights upon entry to a county jail, and it's important that we ensure that any person who enters a county jail is still able to vote. And I just want to touch briefly on um, the speaker's comment about the randomness of finding yourself in jail on election day. 
if you spend any time watching pretrial detention hearings um, across the state, you'll see that a number I really can't quantify of people who have entered a jail because they have failed to pay some fine, they forgot to register their vehicle, or something of that sort. And so we have people every day uh, processing through the system um, that you wouldn't think would be there. But it's also important that even if they have committed a misdemeanor crime, they still have that right to vote. Um, so I want to thank the Assemblywoman again, and I urge your passage of this bill. Thank you. Tanya Brown, spelled T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N, advocates for the inmates and the innocent. We support AB 286. We would just like to um, echo the previous comments made here today. And again, unless they have been convicted, and if you are in jail, you have not been convicted, you are innocent, they should be allowed their constitutional rights to vote. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Hi, my name is Ayana, A-Y-A-N-N-A -N -N -A, Simmons Oglesby, O-G-L-E-S-B-Y. Thank you, um, Assemblywoman um, Brittany Miller for this bill and the committee for hearing me right now and I ditto all those who spoke before me and like the speaker, it's relevant because <clears throat> when you're in jail, like that's the lowest part. Jail is like the lowest part and when you have an ability to still be relevant and your, your voice still matter. I think this will help those, whatever reason why they're incarcerated, traffic, whatever, drinking, fighting, whatever the case may be, they're still relevant and they still have a voice and they're still Nevadans, bond or free. So this bill will help them to have something to look forward to, to still have a voice and to be able to voice their voice. And we all, as Nevadans, have a moral obligation to ensure that all Nevadans are treated equally. And I just would like to say we're Nevada strong, we're battle born, and we owe all Nevadans equal opportunity. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Jody Hawking. I'm the founder and executive director of Return Strong. Um, usually I'm here talking to you about prisoners' rights and change that needs to happen in that arena. Today we're here in support of AB 286. Um, one of the things that we do is actually work with people during reentry um, and through various parts of the criminal legal system. We work with an, a reentry program through the University of Florida. They have an evidence-based program that was written by impacted people, practitioners, and researchers. And one of the five key indicators of success after incarceration is civic engagement. Having a voice and feeling like your voice matters is a critical piece that impacts the trajectory of a person's life for the better. No matter whether you vote from a voting center, by absentee ballot from your home, military, deployment, college, or jail, that experience in becoming an active a part of our democracy is critical. It's time to also make sure that people who have the legal right to vote have access to vote. We support AB 286 and thank Assemblywoman Miller and the organizations that were such a big part of bringing this to the forefront um, for doing all of the work that they've done. It's a much needed step towards ensuring that we exist in a representative democracy. Thank you. For the record, Atar Hasibula, first name spelled A-T-H-A-R. Last name spelled H-A-S-E-E-B-U-L-L-A-H. -E -E I'm the Executive Director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Nevada. We are in full support of this bill. Uh, we are grateful to the bill sponsor and all those on the committee um, that have worked to uh, bring this bill into fruition. Uh, we appreciate the discourse. We've also seen uh, some negative feedback around this concept of jail voting in recent months, much rooted in misperception related to the difference between, to the Assemblywoman's point, jail voting and prison voting. The presumption of innocence remains strong. The ACLU is at the forefront of fighting for these constitutional rights and civil liberties. Uh, in light of recent news, we'd hope that the presumption of innocence remains a bipartisan issue and anyone tempted to uh, oppose this bill would consider the ramifications of denying anyone the right to vote uh, pre-conviction. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. We are also in support of this bill and thank the Assemblywoman for bringing it forward. It does protect the presumption of innocence and allows somebody their constitutional right to vote and participate in our democracy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Eric Jeng, E-R-I-C, J-E-N-G, uh, here as Acting Executive Director for One API Nevada, but also my other hat as Director of Outreach for Asian Community Development Council that has registered more than 36,000 people in the state to vote and has been spreading message on voting rights and civic engagement for our communities. We are in full support of this bill, and we thank Assemblywoman Miller for bringing it up. Uh, for all Nevadans, that's illegible. This is a uh, voting rights, the uh, privilege, and we are glad uh, that this bill has been brought up. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in Carson City who would like to provide testimony and support? Okay, seeing none, we will go to Las Vegas. You can begin when you're ready. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman and members of this committee. My name is Reverend Leonard B. Jackson. That's L-E-O-N-A-R-D. B is in boy, middle initial. Jackson, J-A-C-K-S-O-N. And I am the director of Faith Organizing Alliance. I'm here in full support of Assembly Bill 286. Our mission is to increase civic participation through faith-based and civic organizations within the Las Vegas Valley in order to advance a community and government that is more caring, just, and equitable. We believe that every eligible voter should have the opportunity to exercise their constitutional right to vote, including our brothers and sisters who are incarcerated in our county and city jails prior to their conviction. For the past few years, we have conducted voter registration programs registering eligible Nevada applicants for encouraging them to update their information. One space we send the canvases is to outstanding in individuals that are coming out of the system. We place our chairs out, we have conversations with our individuals that are coming out off of probation, off of parole, to help build a better Clark County. We speak to Nevadans coming in and out of the parole and probation building. Most had no idea that they are, have the opportunity to register to vote once they are set free. In addition to creating a system that allows eligible voters to cast their ballots in jail, passing AB 286, we create further awareness of voters' constitutional <coughs> rights. We ask you, with an open heart and an open mind, to please set our people free. Be blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, Thank you, please. Chair and members. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Robin Stumps, R-O-B-I-N-S-T-U-M-P-S, and I am in support of this bill. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Gorlo and committee members. For the record, my name is Brian Harris, and I am here in, to testify in, in support on behalf of Battleborn Progress of this bill, AB 286. Um, Battleborn Progress is a member of the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition, and um, we believe that voting is a way for individuals to say um, in their future and have a right that should never be infringed upon. People who have not been convicted of a crime still have the constitutional right and still are members of the community, even if they are detained, and still have a stake in policies and decisions that affect them. Making sure that they can access their right to vote gives them a voice in shaping their future. We urge your support of this amazing piece of legislation, and I want to also thank Assemblywoman Miller and other sponsors of this bill for pushing it forward. Please support AB 286. Thank you very much. Next person can go when you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bush, spelled J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, uh, B-U-S-H, like the former president. I'm here on behalf of myself to testify in support of AB 286. My family and I are lifelong voters, having participated in every election, uh, even volunteering for candidates and issues we believe in. Even though I was raised in a family that prioritizes civic engagement and I keep up to date with the news, I didn't realize that uh, voters in jail still retain, sorry, yeah, I didn't realize that voters in jail still retain their right to vote until recently. In my opinion, if a voter is still eligible to vote, they should have access to their constitutional right to vote. 
if voters can vote out of state or even overseas, we can make sure that voters right here in Nevada uh, can do the same. Please support AB 286. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Martin Walker, currently serving in the U.S. Air Force, and I'm also a member of the 100 Black Men of Las Vegas. I'm here to support AB 286 because I'd like to see those who are in jail in, uh, receive the same type of benefits and ability to vote as I would if I were deployed as a military member. There are those in opposition to this bill. Uh, they uh, erroneously claim that this bill would allow convicted felons who have completed their sentence to vote. However, I submit that they should rest assured that this is not true and only serves to ensure that those who are legally registered to vote can exercise their unencumbered right to do so. They should also remember that a person who has been accused of a felony does not lose their right to vote until adjudication of the case has resulted in a conviction. States like Illinois, Wisconsin, California, Colorado, Philadelphia, Rhode Island, Texas, and so on, they already have uh, these, these measures in place. And as also stated, uh, there are places we have this already in, in place here. Just want to codify it with this bill. Voting is an important right in this country so that so many, uh, so many take for granted here and so many don't have in other countries. It is one of the great attributes of our American democracy that needs to be utilized wherever, uh, whether someone is in jail or out of custody. As a member of the military, I wear a uniform that represents protection of freedom, democracy, and the values of American community. We must remember that people in jail are a part of our community. Continue to treat them as such can help their, their reintegration into society once they have completed their sentence. If, if we're going to have a significant role in returning individuals into our, our communities at large, uh, stronger, stronger uh, citizens, uh, one of the best ways to do so is to establish a polling place or at least allow them the opportunity to exercise their right while in custody. Thank you. And again, I support this measure. Respect to the chair and to the Senate committee. For the record, my name is Bishop Derek, D-E-R-E-K, Remsen, R-I-M-S-O-N, representing NAACP as the chair for political action and social justice of the subcommittee. And of course, we celebrate and salute Assemblywoman Brittany Miller for presenting this bill, AB 286, and for the sake of not sounding redundant, uh, we support this tremendous bill of AB 286. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Aria Flores, A-R-I-A-F-L-O-R-E-S, and I'm here on behalf of Chispa Nevada with the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition. We are in support of AB 286. 286 will allow the use of the systems in place such as the Nevada Effective Absentee System for Elections, NVEs for short, to be accessible to incarcerated folks to pre-register to vote, register to vote, and cast their ballots. With this in mind, it is also important to highlight that these members that have been incarcerated have a constitutional right to be able to vote until they have been convicted. Furthermore, this is also an issue of social and economic in inequities. Many of these people in county and city jails are in these positions due to their inability to afford their bail. Regardless of one's financial means, anyone should have the right to vote and be a part of our democracy. AB 286 is carving a pathway to a more equitable and just democratic process. I or urge you to support AB 286. Thank you for your time. Uh, hello, my name is Yesenia Moya, Y-E-S-E-N-I-A-M-O-Y-A. Today, I am here in support of AB 286. I would like to thank the Assemblywoman for bringing this to the committee and also to the folks who put in countless hours to help to put this forth. Um, the foundation of any democracy is the vote. It is people's right to have a say in what happens in their community. And as those folks that are eligible, 
Um, we know that even though there is access to voting, that doesn't necessarily mean there is accessibility or that the process currently is accessible. This bill is asking to create that accessibility. Um, that will then enable our folks to continue to have a voice in the community for for many years to come. So really, really do appreciate, and I hope that you help to pass AB 286. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in Las Vegas who would like to provide testimony in support of AB 286? Okay, seeing none. Broadcasting? Is there anybody on the telephone who would like to provide testimony in support of two, AB 286? To testify in support of Assembly Bill 286, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good evening, committee. Uh, my name is Taylor Patterson. That's T-A-Y-L-O-R-P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. I'm the executive director of Native Voters Alliance Nevada. We are the largest uh, Native American community organization in the state. I'll keep it short because all of my partners said it better than I ever could, but I will just remind the committee that our people, Native Americans, are grossly overrepresented in jails across the country. While we work on fixing this broken system, it is essential that our people, the first Americans, retain their constitutional rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Good afternoon, Chair Gorlo and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Quentin Savoy. That's Q U E N T I N. Last name S like Sam, A like Apple, B like Victor, W O I R. <laughs> I'm speaking with you today as president of the Las Vegas branch of the NAACP, but also just the lover of democracy. Uh, and ditto plus one everything that all of my partners and colleagues and comrades in the community have said. But <clears throat> I wanted to be on the record to just say how proud I am of Nevada for being on the forefront of not only protecting democracy, but expanding democracy. In my day job, I work to recruit election administrators all across the country. And you wouldn't believe the barrage of stories I hear and read of misinformation festering and dismantling our democracy. We are protecting democracy. This is how you show community that democracy works and it has tangible impact on their lives. So thank you so much for protecting our democracy, for fortifying it. Assemblywoman Miller, you the bomb. Thank you all so much. Have a good day. Thank you very much, caller. Broadcasting next caller, please. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Jessica Munger, M-U-N-G-E-R, and I'm the Program Manager of Silver State Equality, Nevada's statewide LGBTQ plus civil rights organization. And we are in support of AB 286. Simply put, voting is a right that does not go away upon incarceration and eligible voters should have an opportunity to vote. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you very much. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Hello, my name is Amber Giroux, spelled G-I-R-O-U-X, and I'm calling in support of this bill and uh, thanking Assemblywoman uh, Miller for bringing it uh, because absolutely um, echoing just everything uh, everyone has said in support and just want to um, put my name on the record as supporting this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Yasmin Pelaez, Y-A-Z-M-Y-N-P-E-L-A-E-Z. And I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Conservation League in support of AB 286. NTL envisions a future where all Nevadans can thrive because they have access to a healthy climate, clean air, clean water and outdoor spaces, as well as safe, healthy and sustainable communities. This vision isn't possible without a fair, and inclusive democracy in which all voters can participate. This includes voters who are awaiting trial, which partners have highlighted today. We urge the committee to support this bill and thank you for your time. 
Thank you very much, caller. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. I'm the Policy Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada, here in support of Assembly Bill 286. A plan we believe our democracy is most vibrant the more people are able to participate in it. In elections prior, we have worked closely with the Mass Liberation Project to mail hundreds of absentee ballot request forms to eligible voters who are in jail and awaiting trial so that their voices can be heard and their constitutional right to vote can be recognized. Nevada has made great strides in the past five years to increase access to the ballot box and encourage people to vote with voting rights restoration, tribal polling locations, and vote by mail. Passing Assembly Bill 286 would continue to put Nevada forward as a leader in democracy, and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Thank you, Chairwoman Gorlo and members of the committee. My name is Dakota Hopkins. I'm the political director for SEIU Local 1107. SEIU is proud to support AB 286. Uh, AB 286 will allow those who have not been convicted of a crime to cast a ballot and let those voices be heard as they are awaiting trial or court date for a conviction. SEIU believes everyone that is legally able to vote should have the opportunity to do so, and we believe this is another great bill to improve Nevada's election system and Nevada's access to the ballot. We urge your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Gorlo and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Deanna Levis, L-E-I, V as a Victor, A-S. I am the Secretary Treasurer of United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 711, which represents about 7,000 uh, members and their families. I strongly urge the committee to support AB 286. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last digits, 931, you may begin. Good evening. My name is Sharon King-Savage. I'm the health, health and wellness Jefferson for the Las Vegas NAACP branch 1111. And I support AB 286 to ensure access to voting inside city and county jails. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Dear Garlo and members of the committee, my name is Linda Stout, L-I-N-D-A-S-T-O-U-T, a volunteer member of Sierra Club's Legislative Committee. On behalf of the club, the world's largest environmental uh, volunteer organization, and our more than 30,000 members and supporters statewide, I am speaking in support of AB um, 286. Access to voting is a prerequisite for a functional democracy. Codifying AB 286 is an important next step in creating a smooth process for voting in our jails, detention centers, and rehabilitation centers. We urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting. Next caller, please. If you have recently joined and would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 286, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Hi, my name is Jerry Burton, it's J-E-R-I-B-U-R-T-O-N, and I'm the co-executive director of the Nevada chapter of the National Organization for Women. And we thank Assemblywoman Miller for this bill. We're in support of AB 286 to make sure people in jails have the ability to access their constitutional right to vote. And we hope you'll pass AB 286. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please.
Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Carrie Dermick. That is K-E-R-R-Y-D-U-R-M-I-C-K. And I'm the Nevada State Director for All Boys Local Action. Even though Nevada provides multiple options to vote and same-day voter registration, voters who are currently in detention centers and jails do not currently have fair and equal access to voting. AB 286 would only provide more access to voting and voter registration to any individual who is detained during election. We strongly encourage you to support AB 286, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Broadcasting next caller, please. Uh, member of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sarah Rojas, R-O-J-A-S, and I'm here today in support of AB 286. Um, thousands of people in jail today across America are being held pre-trial, um, and they have a constitutional right to vote, and Nevada has a responsibility to all eligible constituents to protect that right. I urge you to support AB 286. Thank you. Thank you very much. Broadcasting next caller, please. Chair, there are no other callers to testify in support at this time. Thank you very much. We'll then move to testimony in opposition of AB 86. Is there anybody in Carson City who would like to come to the table in opposition of AB 286? Please begin when you're ready. Chairwoman and committee, uh, my name is Lynn Chapman, and um, I'm with Nevada Families for Freedom. Uh, it's been a long day. Um, we are, I didn't get to see the um, amendment until I walked in, and I've kind of read through it a little bit, and uh, it does make the bill better, and I was glad to see some of the things um, that would make it better. I would like to point out that um, I know that not everyone is convicted when they're in jail. They haven't been convicted, but there are many people that become convicted. Uh, and I think we should remember any victims that might have been um, uh, of victims of the people that were convicted. And even though they're not convicted yet, they might become convicted. Um, I did, uh, I do know that this is about detention centers and about jail and not prison, but uh, I do have a couple of um, articles that I thought were interesting, and it does talk about felons, and it does talk about prison, but the idea behind what they're saying could uh, fit into a jail or detention center. And one is an editorial page from the Freelance Star, February 2021. Felons should not be able to cancel out their victims' votes before they've completed their sentences, shown some remorse for their victims, and made whatever court-ordered restitution is required. That is only fair. Uh, another one is the Boston Herald, April 2019. Um, and it says, and, and I understand this was a terrible thing. Apart from the shocking imagery of the wretched marathon bomber casting a vote, we must ask ourselves if citizens who have no respect for the laws of the land should have a hand in their authorship. And I think that's the important part. Um, if people are then uh, convicted, but they got to vote, and that's kind of concerning. Uh, also, John Lott, Ph.D., um, wrote a, a paper, um, and he was a visiting professor at the State University of New York, and he did say that there is a moral side of issues. Why is yeah. it? Ms. Chapman, your tw two minutes are up. Can you quick wrap oh, up? Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much. You can submit your testimony writing to the secretary as well. Thank you very much. Anyone else who would like to testify in opposition of AB 286? Seeing none in Las Vegas, is there anyone there? Please come to the table. Don't forget to uh, say and spell your name for the record, and you may begin when you're ready.
Hello, my name is Susan Proffitt, P-R-O-F-F-I-T-T, and I'm the Vice President of the Nevada Republican Club. And um, I am also the lady who sued Joe Gloria, our registrar, for the right to have meaningful observations of the election process from start to finish. And um, I'd like to just quickly explain. We brought a team in there, we assessed the operations, and we have found problems. And um, so that has a bearing on my position here. I oppose this because um, 286, we do not have enough polls in Clark County already. We had 215, and the additional cost of manning these polls will drive up the election and hamper our ability to observe the election process. Further felons are not allowed to vote. How do you secure these types of elections? Why can't they return their mail ballots? Okay, now, the biggest problem we did find here in Clark County just so you know, is chain of custody. And when you were explaining the bill, I was listening very, very carefully. And other than, the, you know, the fact that it is against the law for felons to vote in this country, I mean, I'm, I'm not addressing that. The problem is the chain of custody. And if you can't have a chain of custody that you can trust in Clark County, how can you trust one in a prison? Okay, because how are we going to get in there and observe those elections? Because we do have a right to do that. Unfortunately, we did not have secure chain of custody in Clark County. And I'd like you to address that in the future, too, if you would, please. Thank you for your time. I oppose this. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in Las Vegas who would like to come to the table in opposition of AB 286? Hey, seeing none. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the telephone who would like to testify in opposition of AB 286? To testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 286, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last digits 280, please press star 6 to unmute your phone. Hi, my name is Lorena Cardenas, L-O-R-E-N-A-C-A-R-D-E-N-A-S. Uh, I believe being a law-abiding citizen comes with certain perks, such as having a voice as to who governs you. People that break the law and can't govern themselves shouldn't be deciding who governs the rest of us. I believe they can become full-functioning members of society once they are free and behave according to the law. That said, it doesn't surprise me that Democrats want to, once again, side with people who break the law. Thank you. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Hi, I apologize. My name is Katrin Ivanov, I-V-A-N-O-F-S. -S. I just had a little time to skim over some of the new things on that field. Based Ma'am, I'm sorry, we're having difficulty hearing you. Can you start over and maybe speak a little bit louder? Is that better? Much better, thank you. Hello? Okay, so uh, my name is Katrin Ivanov, I-V-A-N-O-F-F, -F, and I'm opposing this bill. Uh, I was only able to skim a little bit on it, but... Uh, Page 3, line 4 says, Local facility for detention of children. Line 6, Regional facility for treatment uh, and rehabilitation of children. Line 8, State facility for the detention of children. What does all this facility for children have to do with voting? Ma'am, no ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yes. You're looking at the bill before it's been amended. That part's been taken out. I just wanted to let you know that. Oh. Oh, okay. 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 I'll continue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the rest is not about that. I'm glad that that's gone. Uh, there is no need for voting booths in those facilities. They can fill out their mailing ballots like the rest of us. 
uh, we all get those barriers regarded if we want it or not, thanks to you. There is no clear instruction as to chain of custody of the voting ballot. Furthermore, chain of custody of our ballots should be straightened, not only for prisoners, but for uh, regular people as well. Ballots should have watermarks, and we should be able to know at any time the location of every ballot. If we can track a mail package and get message on our phone as to the location of that package, we should be able to do that with our ballots. They are way more important than our mail. For the record, can you please stop calling our country a democracy? We are a constitutional republic if we can keep it. Thank you very much. I strongly oppose this bill. Oh, this bill probably good, but it needs a lot of corrections and amendments. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Thank you for calling. And um, please take a look at the amendment that has been submitted. Broadcasting, next caller, please. My name is Ellen Gifford. I have questions developed prior to the presented amendment. Nevada Administration Code 293015 states in part, the Secretary of State will interpret the term polling place to mean any place that is designated by the county clerk for voting by personal appearance. This bill seeks to create exclusive polling places in the jail, only for jailed people meaning that Nevada would have election polling places where law-abiding citizens would not be allowed to vote. Where in the statute are exclusive polling places defined? Will the administrative code and the revised statutes have to undergo a major overhaul to address that term? And does this open the door to future other kinds of exclusive polling places? Section 10 of this bill addresses NRS 293274, which reads in part, the county clerk shall allow members of the general public to observe the conduct of voting at a polling place. Section 10 of this bill seeks to leave what the county clerk shall do up to the decision of the person who administrates the jail. Section 5 of this bill addresses adding election information to the prisoner handbook. Is this handbook available to the public so that we will be able to see how our elections are being addressed? and if the content adheres to our administrative codes and revised statutes. This bill also seeks to give jail people the ability to register to vote and vote on the same day. How will these exclusive jail people be able to meet the requirements of either NRS 293, 5842, or 5847? This bill mandates the Secretary of State to perform what appears to be another overhaul of the administrative code to accommodate these requirements. And how far would the new code deviate from what is required of law-abiding voters? Lastly, Section 14 of this bill addresses establishing drop boxes at the jail for exclusively the jail person's mail-in ballot. How does this impact our administrative code and revised statutes? Hopefully the aforementioned uh, amendments have addressed some of my questions, but I'm sure not all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Broadcasting, next caller, please. Good afternoon, Oscar Williams, O-S-C-A-R-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. -L -L um, I am opposed to AB 286. I think that uh, um, Bringing electronic voting into the jails is uh, not a good thing uh, for various reasons. Uh, one of the big ones are cost, manpower, security. Uh, that's a big burden to put on uh, municipalities uh, and, and state prisons as well. Um, uh, there's an innate lack of transparency with electronic voting. Uh, um, they have options already available to them that are working, and there's really no reason to... Uh, try to make it more complicated than it already is uh, and burdensome on on the, the jail system. Um, there's a real issue with ballot secrecy from what I understand. All mail that goes in and out of jails has to be opened and screened and recorded and documented. 
there's no secrecy there. Or, or how is that treated within this law? I seem to conflict with other laws. Uh, and uh, um, there's also an issue of bribery, coercion, and so on. Uh, maybe if there's a, um, hey, if, if you vote a certain way, you, you'll get privileges, or if you don't vote a certain way, you'll be restricted or punished. Uh, and how would we know? There's no transparency to that outside. Uh, it creates a culture of, uh, or subculture within the prison system that is the very essence of why we don't allow them to vote. And as other speakers have said, uh, there are federal laws. Uh, in particular, uh, the last speaker said something really great. Um, it treads on counties' constitutional rights to designate the places of elections. This is a state power grab. It's got to stop. The counties have rights to say where and when we get to vote. Period. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. B-Y-R-U-S. H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. I oppose this bill. Ditto all the previous comments. Goodness gracious, you guys are pushing so many bills. You're making me yield my time. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Yes, my name is Leslie Quinn. And I oppose AB 286. Now, not because non-felons don't have a constitutional right to vote, but most non-felons in jail are there awaiting conviction to go to prison as a felon. Um, in fact, they're waiting there for conviction um, for we don't know what. You could have a mass murder in there who's, con who's con uh, currently a non-felon, and they're waiting for their conviction. conviction. If you are in an in addition, the monies that would be spent to put a polling place at a jail breaches security for that specific jail. So if there was truly somebody that was in jail as a non-felon, um, I don't know, maybe they ran a red light too many times, whatever it is, um, then why not use an absentee or mail-in ballot to avoid, avoid a poll site? Please vote no against AB 286. This is a political move to get more votes and legislation, um, and we're going down a bad place. When people make bad decisions, they have, unfortunately, bad consequences. We want to promote people in America that are here to help one another and not to continue down the destructive path that AB 286 is going. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. If you have recently joined and like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 286, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no other callers to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. We will then go to testimony in neutral in Carson City. Thank you very much for joining us. Please state and spell your name, and you may begin when ready. Thank you, Chairwoman, uh, Committee, Jamie Rodriguez. That's J-A-M-I-E-R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z. I am the Washoe County Registrar of Voters. I uh, want to appreciate the Assemblywoman working with us. Um, as was noted in the presentation, we do offer uh, providing ballots to our inmates in the Washoe County Detention Facility. It's a program that's worked really, really well. Um, and to your point, Speaker Yeager, we actually, of the general election, we had two ballots not returned. And when we followed up, found out that those individuals had actually been released before submitting their ballot. Um, and, and so, right, th those things do happen. So uh, we look forward to continuing to work with the Assemblywoman to ensure that we can implement the bill as, as intended um, as we transition this from a county practice to a state mandate. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, Ashley Garza Kennedy representing Clark County I'm here testifying in neutral with the bill as amended uh, similar to Washoe County we do also have a practice in Clark County to ensure those who are for example in uh, the Clark County Detention Center who are eligible to vote are able to do so we have liaisons in the jail and also liaisons with our elections department that coordinate to make that happen uh, we appreciate the assemblywoman for working with us on mm -hmm. this um, in addition to the Nevada ease system that has been talked about uh, we think that is actually um, a good 
good tool uh, that is easy to implement. Um, so we will continue working with the sponsor to make sure um, that we can continue to, to uh, make sure that we're allowing eligible voters in jail to vote as they have been. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in Carson City who would like to testify in neutral? Okay, seeing none. Las Vegas, is there anybody in Las Vegas who would like to come to the table in neutral? Okay, seeing none. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the telephone who would like to testify in neutral of AB 286? To testify in neutral for Assembly Bill 286, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. Assemblywoman Miller, would you like to? Nope. All right. Thank you very much. Then I will close the hearing on AB 286. <laughs> We will give our vice chair a moment. Oh, never mind. She's not coming up here. Okay, later. <laughs> She'll come back eventually. <laughs> All right, we have closed the hearing on AB 286. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Joint Resolution Number 5. This measure proposes to amend the Nevada Constitution to revise provisions relating to lotteries and the sale of lottery tickets. We'll give our Assemblyman C.H. Miller a moment to join at the table. <laughs> and whenever you're ready, you may begin. Sorry, everyone I had to get my technology together. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am C.H. Miller, representing Assembly District 7 down in uh, the South in Clark County. I am excited to have the opportunity to present Assembly Joint Resolution 5 to you all today. Uh, this measure proposes to amend the Nevada Constitution to revise provisions relating to lotteries and the sale of lottery tickets. Uh, my co-sponsor, Assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno, as we all know, is not here today. Um, she had planned to make some remarks. I'm gonna make them for her. It's just gonna be wrapped up in here, no. <laughs> but I definitely wanted to um, just send her some love and say thank you for joining me in um, this challenging but monumental effort. So let's talk about some history of the lottery and our Constitution. In 1864, Nevada only had 40,000 residents. It ratified its Constitution, modeled after California's, which prohibited the operation of a lottery and sales of a lottery tickets in any form. We became the battle-born state, number 36, and at that time, the lottery was on a sharp downturn around the country. Lotteries were unregulated by the government, fraught with corruption, mismanagement, and fraud. Simply put, operators were not paying out their, the, the rewards, which resulted in protests across 33 states that made up the union with only three states, Delaware, Missouri, and Kentucky, still operating their lotteries. However, by 1895, the Anti-Lottery Act passed Congress prohibiting lotteries across all 44 U.S. states. So at that time, our Constitution reflected the collective views and opinions of the union we were joining. A union that had just one year previously declared that all persons held as slaves henceforward shall be made free. I only give you that as a brief, brief history as to the true and real reason why Nevada's comp constitution prohibited the lottery since our inception as a state. So now let's fast forward to the modern era of the lottery which came back to life in 1934 in Puerto Rico with the first modern day government run lottery in the US. However, it didn't begin to catch on with states until 1964 when New Hampshire became the first state, official state to bring the lottery back. 
This new lottery, modern lottery, was operated and regulated by the government. And today, 45 states, D.C., Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands all have modernized their constitutions to support the operations of the modern lotteries, but not in Nevada. So often our story is that we are behind the trend of what's happening rather than being the trailblazers we truly are, like when we were the first state to legalize widespread gambling in 1931 and most recently became the first female majority legislature. But hey, no use in crying over spilled milk. It is what it is, right? So what's my point in sharing all this history? Well, first of all, whenever we consider changing something as significant, historical, and stabilizing as the Constitution, we should understand the history behind what's currently there and why it's there. And as today's elected body of the people of Nevada, good stewardship requires that we take the time to modernize our statutes and our Constitution. And if we're honest, we must realize this prohibition may be outdated and not reflective of the views, beliefs, and cultural norms of the three million Nevadans that now call Nevada home and would like to have and would like to have what they would like to have in their constitution. Now what's most exciting about all of this is that we, this elected body, has the opportunity to give Nevadans a chance to weigh in on if they want to continue sending their money to other states whose proceeds go to support many different things within those states. For, for example, not that we send our money to Puerto Rico, but when they established their um, lottery, it was health care after two hurricanes and the Great Depression exacerbated a tuberculosis outbreak. For many other states, it provides infrastructure funding for things like public transportation, which I believe in Washington, D.C. just became free, or college scholarships in many other states. Public education, like in California, where their lottery has given $41 billion to education since the lottery began in 1985. Speaking of which, Nevadans, many of which people we know, myself included, all drive to our state's borders, surrounding state's borders, to purchase lottery tickets, to contribute to what other states are doing for their residents with Nevadans' money. Let's consider how the four states that surround Nevada spend their earnings. Idaho, 73 million earned in 2022. 62% of that goes to public education, about $45 million. Arizona, 269 million in 2022. Many programs, they have many programs, but the things that stood out to me were healthcare, public education, tribal college dual enrollment programs. Oregon, 909 million in 2022. Theirs goes to the Oregon Fund, which funds a multitude of programs like outdoor schools and veteran services. And then there is California, the big fish, right? Which gave $2 billion in 2022 to education. 79% went to public schools. The thing to note about California is that of their, that seven of their 10 highest selling lottery retailers surround the Nevada border. And the two with the highest sales are right on the border of Nevada, being at Prim, the location I frequent the most in the south, unless the line is too long, then I drive a little further to Baker, or Gold Ranch, which is about 45 minutes from this very building. My point here is Nevadans are already playing the lottery in a very significant way, putting lots of money into the good and worthy programs that support youth in other states. While we continue to suffer at home with not being able to cut the pie up enough to service all the needs of our youth, our future, at some point we have to take care of home first. We are one of only five states that does not have a lottery and one of only two states that has neither a lottery or a state income tax, our partner there being Alaska. Now, interestingly enough, Oregon touts its lottery earnings as the second largest funding source after state income taxes. We have neither. And, a report, and report after report proved that Nevadans are struggling in a multitude of areas because of it. But one being the most severe is mental health. It's no secret that in Nevada, that if Nevadans decide to have a lottery in our state, that I want that money to go towards mental health. 
particularly mental health for our youth. It's no, it, and you've all seen or heard the reports and the list that rank Nevada at the bottom of mental health resources, um, having the, the lowest re investment into mental health resources, and at the top of the highest suicide, rate, suicide rates of our youth. That's our future that's taking themselves out. This is a somewhat sensitive topic for me because I've had to battle suicidal thoughts in my teens and near attempts in my early adult years. Had I not had the help of a mental professional when I was 13 and then again when I was 15, I might not be here today. Had I not had my faith in my adulthood, I might not be here today sitting before you as an elected member of this body, elected to represent the voice of 70,000 people in Assembly District 7. A member of this body tasked with the responsibility of shaping policy that I genuinely believe will help the well-being of our youth, our future. At the call of my co-sponsor and the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, over the last two weeks in Ways and Means, we heard from every single school district in our state. And they all made mention of the severe state of mental health issues amongst their staff and students. This is a problem we didn't get into overnight and certainly one we're not going to get, we're going to fix overnight. So we must be forward thinking about how we can address this long term resource, this, this with a long term resource investment strategy. This is why I once again wanted to bring forward the possibility of the lottery and take it to the people of Nevada to decide if they want a lottery in their state or if they prefer to continue driving to borders or sending their money back home to the states that they came from rather than putting money into programs within our state. At the end of the day, it's time. We're in a different era. We're in a different time than when we had the prohibition on the lottery. It's time for us to look at that, seriously reconsider it, and give Nevadans the opportunity to decide if they want a lottery in this state. Uh, I will now go over the bill contents. AGR 5, it's uh, fairly to the point. First, it proposes to amend the Nevada Constitution to allow the legislature to provide by law for the operation and regulation of lotteries, including authorizing the sale of lotteries, lottery tickets for such lotteries. Second, the resolution prohibits the legislature from granting a special charter to any person or entity to operate a lottery or sell lottery tickets. This ensures the public continues to be protected against such lotteries that are vulnerable to fraud and that cause harm and that have caused harm in the past. Third, the resolution prohibits any po political subdivisions within the state from operating a lottery or selling lottery tickets. Lotteries shall be state regulated only. And finally, Assembly Joint Resolution 5 does not remove the authorization of charitable nonprofit activities to operate a lottery in the form of a raffle or drawing. The joint resolution simply clarifies that the operation of such lotteries must comply with existing provisions governing charitable lotteries that were added to the Nevada Constitution by amendment in 1990. In closing, with all that being said, I know there are some historical opponents of establishing a lottery in Nevada. I've had multiple conversations and meetings with the goal of inviting our gaming industry and partners to the table to build something that works for all Nevadans. I imagine they will remain in opposition today, to which I completely understand. However, I will remain true to my invitation and I hope that they will take me up on the offer as I stated to build something from the ground up that works for all Nevadans. I know we can once again set the gold standard and yet another facet of gaming, but first step, we have to give Nevadans the opportunity to decide if they want it in our state. So with all that being said, I will stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assemblyman. Do we have any questions from the committee? If I go. Okay. We'll go with Dickman first. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Um, so you talked a lot about mental health issues, and we certainly do have shortcomings here, but where in this um, joint resolution does it 
say that it's going to mental health. Um, if we let the people put this out to the people and they pass it, who decides where this money is going? Because I got to say, I'm from Michigan and I was there when they implemented the lottery. It was supposed to transform education and lots of the money never made it there. So just wondering how we're going to do that differently here. Thank you for the question, uh, Assemblywoman Dickman. I would, Chair, is it okay if I go directly to the member? Yes, but please space, um, state your name. For the record, yes. Raise my chair up. Uh -oh, I'm trying. All right. Assemblyman C.H. Miller, for the record. Um, thank you for the question, uh, Assemblywoman Dickman. And so, as it relates to this particular bill, the goal of this bill is to enable the state to enact a lottery if the people of Nevada so chose. It would then be incumbent upon the legislature with, I imagine, the input from our residents and the people on how exactly we do that and um, then direct those uh, monies directly to youth mental health. As it relates to what has happened in other states, I think the history gives us an opportunity to do something different, to do it better, knowing that things haven't gone exactly well in some states. There are some states where that's not the um, sentiment. Appreciate that. So quick follow-up. Go ahead. So is there a reason that it's not in here what you would like to see the money go to? I mean, other, is there a legal reason? C.H. Miller, for the record, yes. So. Um, at the strong advisement of what we consider putting into the legislature, I mean, into the Constitution, it is, um, as we know how difficult it is to change things in the Constitution, right? So in the event that, say, someone, say, our um, Mr. Tesla, Elon Musk, decided to leave a few hundred million dollars or a billion dollars towards youth mental health, that money would still be stuck in the by constitution going to youth mental health when we could have essentially funded the issue another way and could then redirect those monies at a different time. So it ties the hand of the legislature to be able to redirect the money if it's necessary. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Next we'll go with Speaker Yeager. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Assemblyman. Um, like Many of us, I suspect, in Southern Nevada, we hear about this issue from our constituents, uh, particularly when we have billion-dollar multi-state uh, jackpots and we see the lines uh, down there. So I, I appreciate you bringing this. Um, I just had a couple kind of procedural questions. So um, the way I understand the resolution, and I want to make sure this is accurate, this would have to go to the voters in 24, uh, 2024 election, then go to the voters again in the 2020. Is it just once? Okay. Good. 2024 election. I'm glad I'm asking the question. Um, but in uh, in the language under section, I guess it's really the heart of the bill in, in, uh, pay, on page four, it says the legislature may provide by law. So I just want to get that on the record. This doesn't require the legislature to actually establish a lottery. It al would allow for the legislature to establish it if they wanted to, they may establish it. Is that your understanding of what it's doing? C.H. Miller, for the record, yes, uh, Speaker Yeager. Uh, so yes, to answer that directly, yes, it enables the legislature, if it so chose, to um, have a lottery. It does, despite the emails that I've got saying, um, it should, um, we should put in the Constitution that a certain legislature has to um, enact the lottery. This says may, so the legislature at that time um, once it has been approved by the vote of the people, um, would then have the decision, or future legislatures would have the decision if they wanted to add a lottery to this state. I do want to um, correct, uh, with, at the risk of correcting uh, speakers' understanding of the process here, <laughs> I do want to correct um, you know, a couple of things that you said. So what would happen now is the process of getting this to the people is it would have to pass in this identical form this legislative session, the next legislative session, and then it would go to the ballot for the people. So we're looking at, I think that is puts us at 2026 
um, before Nevadans would have an opportunity to vote. Thanks. Can I ask a follow-up, please? Yeah, thank you for that clarification. I think I knew that somewhere in my brain, but uh, my brain is operating on Friday wavelengths instead of Tuesday wavelengths today. So, so I appreciate that. And, and so, you know, here's the second question there. I, obviously, um, I shouldn't say obviously, we never know who's going to be returning to this building. Some of us will run for re-election and, and return. Some of us will run and lose, and some of us will decide we don't want to do this again. But I'm going to uh, assume that you probably uh, do want to come back. And so uh, actually enacting a lottery would require legislation from the legislature to talk about how it's going to be set up. And while I don't, I'm not asking about the specifics, I'm just asking in your mind, have you thought about a process for how that kind of work uh, would be done because as you mentioned every state's different every state has a different type of lottery some have scratch off some have video lottery, lottery terminals some have uh, part of the multi-state some have their own pow pick three or pick four that they do and as uh, assemblywoman dickman said i think michigan has like all those things including an online lottery uh, so just wanted to know some of your thoughts on how uh, if you were to handle this issue, how the legislature would figure out what does make sense for the state of Nevada. Thank you, C.H. Miller, for the record. Uh, yes, so I have thought about how we start to um, build out a lottery if the legislature shows, if we needed to bring forth legislation for a lottery. And I think it incorporates putting a working group together that incorporates all the um, stakeholders and interested parties um, to participate in dialogue and building out best practices, evaluating the experience um, of other states um, and putting together something that could be innovative, um, new, world class. We are one of the only states that we are the only state that has gaming in the, um, with the history of gaming, the experience of gaming, the gold standard of gaming, the robustness of gaming than any other state in the union. Um, and I think we can leverage that to build something that is really great, but it takes a process of everybody coming to the table and working together on what that looks like. And so that's what I would like to see moving forward is a working group where we start to um, come together, put it all together, build it from the ground up, and then give the future legislature something really sound that um, will work for Nevada. Could I just ask one more quick follow-up? I just wanted to confirm that legislation, enabling legislation, is that something that's happening this session or is that would that be in a future session? C.H. Miller, for the record, that would be in a future session. So there, as far as I know, <laughs> there are no other members in the House or the, uh, in the Assembly or the Senate that have bills um, that would be setting up the structure of a lottery, and I've not had any conversations with anyone about setting up the structure of a lottery. Thank you, Speaker. Next, we'll go with Assemblyman DeLong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate you pointing out the uniqueness of Nevada with our well-established uh, and very sophisticated gaming industry, which does make Nevada unique from the other, other 50 states plus territories. Um, and I know this is a policy committee, but what we're talking about here is raising money. Um, and, you know, putting in a lottery is, is all about the concept of generating revenue for the state. Has there been an economic analysis done um, with the concept of a lottery and how it would affect the uniqueness of Nevada is in a well-established gaming um, industry? Because there would likely be some negative effect to that income generating side of our balance sheet. Thank you for the question, Assemblyman DeLong. I'm, I'm C.H. Miller for the record. Thank you, Assemblyman DeLong. So there has been, um, in the past, I believe there has been economic studies on what that would look like. I think that where we are now is if we move this, this resolution forward, that is something that we consider in the development up of an actual lottery because those that information may be very valuable in how we actually structure a successful lottery in our state that does not create a negative 
um, on the other side of the balance sheet. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll go with Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And thank you, Assemblyman Miller, for, um, for presenting this. Uh, my question was, in, this, in the discussion about setting up the state laws around um, running a lottery, I know um, in many cases these are multi-state lotteries, and um, I imagine that those come with some already sort of prepackaged um, regulations around them that you have to ascribe to if you're going to be part of that. Um, is that your understanding that that if we were to do that multi-state, if this passes, of course, you know, 10 years down the line or however many it is, um, that uh, that part of Nevada's legislation would have to ascribe if we wanted to do multi-state to whatever those regulations are that are really controlled outside of our state. C.H. Uh, Miller, for the record, thank you, Assemblywoman Newby. Uh, so yes, I imagine that if we were to get involved in a multi-state uh, lottery, that we would probably have to look at legislation that is um, um, in line with the operations of that multi-state operation. So that is again where that working group will come in to play to say if the people of Nevada are going to get this opportunity to vote, we're going to work together to figure out what is going to be the best practice for Nevada. <laughs> Thank you. Next we'll go with Assemblyman Hibbets. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Assemblyman Miller, uh, Section 24, Subsection 2, Subparagraph A. Um, I know everybody has a copy of this, but for the, anybody watching uh, or listening online, I'm just going to read it real quick so they know what I'm asking about. The legislature shall not pass any laws which grant a special charter or similar organizational or governing document to any person or other entity to operate a lottery or sell lottery tickets or which otherwise authorize the exercise of such powers under a special charter or similar organizational or governing document. Now, after doing my best Susan for a long impersonation. Forgive my ignorance, but what does that mean? C.H. Miller, for the record, thank you for that, Assemblyman Hibbets. So what, what that pretty much means is that no one outside of the state of Nevada can operate a lottery in the Nevada outside of the charitable nonprofit lotteries which we already allow. So that means no individual jurisdiction, no individual company, no one else outside of the legislature of Nevada, the state of Nevada, can establish um, and regulate, operate a lottery. Quick follow-up, if I may. Does that mean we all get those little green visors? <laughs> I mean, if you want one, C.H. Miller for the record. I mean, if that's your thing, we can get you one. I get you one right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, go ahead. Oh, excuse me, Assemblyman. Let me just double check, make sure everyone else is good with their. Okay, please go ahead, Assemblyman DeLong. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to follow up on uh, Assemblyman Hibbett's um, query, it just made me wonder the way that's written, does that mean we're going to have government run establishments that sell tickets? Is that what that um, constitutional language would mean? Or would it be contracted out to private organizations? to sell the government tickets. Assemblyman C.H. Miller for the record. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman DeLong. So it, it does not necessarily mean that the legislature would have to decide how they wanted an opera, a, a, a lottery to roll out. So this does not, um, it, this does not lay out what the lottery would be. This enables the state to operate a lottery. So if the future legislation, if after we have this working group and we put together what the lottery should look like, if that working group comes out and suggests legislation that says, hey, the state needs to have its own brick and mortar locations, then that's what goes forward. Does it pass? Who knows? I, that's not what I foresee. What I foresee is the state being able to partner with already established businesses to be retailers of the lottery, to be partners 
of lottery tickets. Thank you. Okay, then I'll, yes, go ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I just uh, had a question based on what Assemblyman uh, DeLong asked. So, um, Assemblyman Miller, this resolution uh, doesn't need to go to the governor. It goes to the Secretary of State and then goes to the ballot if it's passed twice. But tell me about the enabling legislation. Um, is that a normal bill that has to go through the normal process with governor's signature or potential veto? Thank you, uh, C.H. Miller, for the record. Thank you, uh, Speaker Yeager. So, yes, the enabling legislation, I'm sorry, not the enabling legislation. This would be the enabling legislation, but the legislation that would establish a lottery would have to go through the regular legislative process, meaning that it would have to pass both houses and then go before the governor where it could then be vetoed if um, the governor was not in line with what was in that um, legislation. Let me ask my question first. <laughs> okay. Um, I wouldn't go into the bill, the section two or 24 to um, see about the operation of charitable organizations and just more of a clarifying because um, charities often do lotteries through like houses and cars and other items like that. The current process is that they have to go through the board of gaming and fill out an application and sort of explain the process. The way I'm reading it, that is still in place the way it is now. So I just wanted to get confirmation. Thank you, C.H. Uh, Miller, for the record. Uh, thank you, Chair Gorlow. Yes, that is my understanding, that it would remain the same process for charitable and nonprofit um, organizations. So also, I believe there's a sporting um, team that also does like 50-50s and raffles like that, so that would include them. There might be more than one. I can't afford to go to their games, so <laughs> truth be told. <laughs> uh, Assemblyman C.H. Miller, for the record, again, thank you, Chair. I believe that it would whatever is um, permissible now remains permissible. It does not change anything as it relates to what's currently permissible within the state as it relates to lotteries. Great. Thank you very much. With that, then we'll go with Assemblywoman Dickman. Thank you, Chair, for, for a second um, chance to ask a question. But through some of the conversations here, um, with what you just said about the state being forced to run the lottery, does that not, in effect, force the state to go into competition with the gaming institutions and you know, the very institutions who afford this state not to have an income tax? Thank you, C.H. Uh, Miller, for the record. Thank you, Assemblywoman uh, Dickman. So this is, um, this is my thought on that. Um, we, I am inviting and hoping that the future members of the, um, whoever comes together to develop a lottery structure in our state invites and keeps gaming at the table to be a part, to be partners in what we develop so that it is not a competition or a challenge to their operations. I'll note that in every other state that gaming operate, that many of our gaming partners operate in, they operate alongside lotteries. In Mississippi, which is closest to our state in population, in um, having casino gaming before having a lottery, for 27 years they had it. The lottery was just enacted there in 2019. Gaming partners that operate in our state operate in their state as partners, as retailers of gaming operations. They've still seen profits in the states where they operate with lotteries. That could be true for Nevada. In Mississippi, 122 million in 2022 went to the state, went to programs within Mississippi. Gaming, those gaming partners there still were able to be successful in their gaming operations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the second shot. <laughs> You're very welcome. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and move ahead to testimony and support. 
For those who'd like to provide testimony in support of AJR5, please come to table. Don't forget to state your name and spell it for the record, and you may begin when ready. Paul Katha, last name is spelled C-A-T-H-A. I represent the Culinary Workers Union Local 226. Uh, Nevada is currently only one of five states without a lottery. Um, enacting a state lottery is a, de a dependable source of revenue for nearly every state in the country. And in a state where gaming is the cornerstone of the economy, there's no public policy rationale for uh, continuing the ban on a state lottery in Nevada's constitution. It's difficult to estimate how much money is Nevada, uh, Nevada is losing when Nevada residents purchase lottery tickets in neighboring states. But the figure is uh, almost certainly more than $10 million a year based on traffic at uh, the store that the Assemb Assemblyman Miller mentioned that he uh, frequents in, in Prim. Uh, Nevada is the regulatory gold standard of gaming and it knows how to properly administer gaming in a way that does not negatively impact our citizens. Sustainable investment in, in youth mental health is good public policy that is long overdue and implementing a state lottery would allow Nevada to address an ongoing and urgent public health crisis. It's clear that long-term capacity building for mental health and education is needed, and a specific source of consistent funding is critical for this. Nevada needs sustainable long-term funding to establish, uh, educate, and continue to uh, train mental health professionals, staff our programs, and uh, retain these mental health professionals in the state, filling our considerable gaps in our mental health uh, infrastructure and behavioral health services system. Nevada has an opportunity to create a long-term funding source directed towards mental health capacity building without increasing taxes on Nevada residents or businesses through a state lottery. I urge the Nevada legislature Legislature to support and pass AJR5 and invest in Nevada's youth mental health and education. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead when you're ready. I can't talk that fast. Uh, D. Taylor, I'm president of Unite Here, the parent company of the Culinary and Bartenders Union. First, I, I actually want to congratulate the gaming industry. They had $14.8 billion in revenue, which was a record. And Clark County has had 10 straight months of a billion a month. And their 2023 will be off the charts. Washoe in 22 was up 47% as compared to 2019. So what has the gaming industry done with those monies, as we say? MGM has invested and, in, frankly, share buybacks, $4.7 billion in 2021, another $2 billion. Caesars has spent $1.2 billion on debt. The Atlantis just announced a $400 million investment in Colorado. And we're going to hear from the gaming industry that this is going to hurt jobs. I want to give you a fact. In February of 2023, BLS says there are 148,000 jobs in the gaming industry in Nevada. In January 1994, there were 148,000 jobs. So no jobs have exponentially increased with the profits that they've made. I don't understand why the Nevada Resort Association would be satisfied with having Nevada being last in the country on mental health funding and the education system where we always thank God for Mississippi because they always are the worst. There are 48 states with a lottery and every single state that has commercial gaming has a lottery. And examples of where these companies, the NRA, have gone to and spent enormous amounts of money where there's already a state lottery, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Michigan, Indiana, Mississippi, Louisiana, Ohio, Maryland, Iowa, Illinois, Colorado, Massachusetts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They go where there's already a lottery because they know they can make a lot of money. So there is not a mutually exclusive profit issue. I will just ask you to please pass AJR5, it's for our state, it's for our citizens, it's for our kids. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Please, either Ma one of you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Doug Goodman, D-O-U-G-G-O-O-D-M-A-N. I'm testifying as an individual resident of Sparks. What I'd like to address is what I believe to be the myth that gaming will lose money if Nevada has a lottery. How much does gaming revenue fall when Nevada residents drive to Prim or over to Gold Ranch and wait in lines? Also, I moved to Nevada in 2004 from California, from the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, every Wednesday and Saturday, I would stop at a gas station and buy a lottery ticket. Since I have lived in Nevada, I have never once gone into a casino with a specific goal to gamble. Have I put some money in a slot machine while I'm waiting for my dinner reservations, if I even, in fact, go to a casino for dinner? Uh, 
Yeah, I have. The point is, I cannot be the only one in Nevada, the only local in Nevada who doesn't go to casinos but who does buy a lottery ticket, who would buy a lottery ticket. I don't go to the Gold Ranch. I'm not going to wait in line. Would I stop at a gas station? Would I stop at a convenience store? Would I even go in to a casino and buy a lottery ticket? I would. So it's time for Nevada has a lottery. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Gorlo and members for the committee. For the record, my name is Susie Martinez, and I am the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Nevada State AFL-CIO. And on behalf of over 150,000 members and 120 unions, Nevada State AFL-CIO supports Assembly Bill, I'm sorry, Assembly Joint Resolution 5. Every Nevadan deserves access to affordable, high-quality health care services, and this includes mental health services. Unfortunately, our state is expecting, experiencing a widespread mental health crisis, which was only exasperated by the pandemic. We consistently rank at the bottom for youth health, mental health, and for the sake of our state's future, we must ensure that we have a way to fund and improve our mental health services. This legislation will guarantee that we have a consistent revenue stream for such services so that Nevada's future generations can be happy and healthy. I'd like to thank Assemblywoman Miller I'm, so, I'm sorry, Assemblyman Miller, for bringing, oh my goodness, for bringing this uh, resolution forward. And I strongly urge the committee to support Assembly Joint Resolution um, number five. And um, I'd also like you guys to help me um, uh, not waste any gas. And uh, we need to bring the lottery here to our state. So thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We thank Assemblyman Miller and the Culinary Union for championing this bill. As someone who was born and raised in this state, I have always wondered why we wouldn't do something so easy and common sense. With a limited number of options to raise funds for our state, Nevada can no longer afford to lose out on this revenue. We must diversify our economy and explore all options. The last few years have shown us how critical mental health care is and that our current infrastructure in Nevada is woefully inadequate. Nevada's mental health system is des desperately in need of additional funding to foster improvement because we are in a crisis. By establishing a lottery and directing those funds toward youth mental health programs, Nevada will take a large step forward in becoming a more welcoming state for those who struggle with mental health challenges. I would just like to note how many people have said to me as I prepared for this bill how they drive to Arizona and California put to buy these tickets. They also gamble in our casinos. Both things can be true and can be successful, including my very own parents. This just makes sense and it always has. Please support AGR5 and let Nevada voters decide whether we want this for our future. Hello, my name is Jovan Jackson. I'm a resident of Assembly District 4. Uh, I'm also a qualified mental health associate. Uh, I have been providing mental health services since 2011, and each year we see cuts in services. Even throughout the pandemic, we always hear that, oh, there's a need for more mental health funding. But um, for mental health providers, we have been seeing uh, the opposite. We have seen um, services being cut, have seen programs getting cut, and uh, if the lotto could bring money to um, the mental health system and uh, Nevada welfare, I am all in support of this legislation. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Carter Bundy with AFSCME, we too want to thank Assemblyman Miller um, for bringing this forward. Right now, we're seeing hopefully a bipartisan, bicameral move to start to fund state employees a little bit better than they have been over the last 20 years. But we're still incredibly far behind. And the reality is that we're far behind in education funding. There are so many needs in this state. And the idea that we could diversify our revenue stream, keep Nevada's, Nevadans' money in Nevada, um, and improve all facets of life for Nevadans is really appealing. Um, this is something that I think the voters should get a chance to take a look at. We hope that you'll support this resolution and we thank the sponsor. Thank you very much. Are there anybody else that would like to come to the table in support of AJR 5? Seeing none, we will go to Las Vegas. Please press the microphone button, state and spell your name, and you may begin when ready. 
Hola, mi nombre es María Landeros. Soy una recamarera jubilada en Las Vegas Strip y fui miembro de la Unión Culinaria. Tres de mis hijos adultos sufrieron enfermedades mentales cuando estaban creciendo. A los 15 años, mi hijo mayor comenzó a juntarse con gente equivocada y comenzó a rebelarse. Mi segundo hijo siguió sus pasos. Sabía que mi hijo mayor era travieso, pero no pensé que fuera un problema hasta que comenzó a meterse en peleas en la escuela secundaria. Eventualmente fue expulsado de diferentes escuelas en Las Vegas. Llamaba a los consejeros para obtener ayuda para mis hijos, pero no contestaban el teléfono o no tenían citas disponibles por mucho tiempo. O tenían horarios de citas que no se ajustaban a nuestro horario como padres que trabajan. Mi hija, que entonces tenía 10 años, comenzó a sufrir de depresión. Estaba traumatizada por todo el conflicto familiar que estaba sucediendo. Tuvimos que llevarla al psicólogo y al psiquiatra porque necesitaba medicación a tan corta edad. Ahora soy abuela y me gustaría ayudar a los padres más jóvenes porque la crisis de salud mental de los jóvenes es muy grave. Yo apoyo a JRE. Cinco, y le pido a la legislatura de Nevada que apoye este proyecto de ley. Gracias. I'm going to translate, translate for María Landeros. Uh, hello, my name is María Landeros, M -A -R I A A L A N D E R O S. I am a retired guest room attendant on the Las Vegas Strip and a former culinary union member. The three, three of my adult children suffered from mental health illness when they were growing up. At 15 years old, my oldest son started hanging out with the wrong crowd and started to rebel. My second son followed in his footsteps. I knew my oldest son was mischievous, but I didn't think he was trouble until he started getting into fights in high school. He eventually was expelled from different schools in Las Vegas. I would call counselors to get help for my, for my sons, but they wouldn't answer the phone or didn't have any openings for a long time or had appointment times that didn't work for our schedule as working parents. My daughter, who was 10 at the time, started to suffer from depression. She was traumatized from all the family conflict that was happening. We had to take her to psychologists and psychiatrists because she needed medication at, the young, at that young age. I am a grandmother now, and I would like to help younger parents because the youth mental health crisis is very serious. I support AJR5 and ask Nevada legislator to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, go when you're ready. My name is Ivan Lopez, I-V-A-N-L-O-P-E-Z. I am 20 years old and I'm a proud culinary union kid, child of a culinary union member. I'm here today to support AJR5. The COVID-19 pandemic put extra stress on families like mine. During my senior year of high school, I had very low self-esteem, I had very poor communication skills, and I had an extremely hard time con concentrating in class. I was sleeping excessively, up to 20 hours a day some days. My parents were getting a divorce, and I was feeling extremely stressed out. My grades started to suffer and I wanted some help. My mom was able to manage to find a, one therapist in my area who was one hour away. The first appointment available was a month away. And this whole thing stressed me out more since it was three, a three hour trip and I felt like I was inconveniencing my mom. It was one hour there, one hour in there, and one hour back. We need more therapists to educate parents and children. Therapy helped me a lot. It's embarrassing, embarrassing to say, but it was there that I learned what these feelings were. It was, they were called anxiety and they were called stress. I had no idea what these feelings were until I was 17. We need more resources in schools for youth. Mental health is just as important as physical health. It might be invisible and it's harder to see, but if left untreated, it will have severe consequences. Youth, is a mental, youth mental health is a crisis in Nevada. Something has to change, and that's why I support the amendment to the Nevada Constitution to establish a state lottery. I think this is currently the best way to address this crisis, save lives, 
and make Nevada a better place for everyone. I support AJR5 and I ask the Nevada legislature to invest in us and invest in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and please don't ever be embarrassed for asking for help. Please go ahead when you're ready. Hello, my name is Elsa Roldan and I'm a guest room attendant and culinary union member for 14 years. I'm testifying today in support of AJRS 5. For the past nine years, I have been dealing with Nevada's mental, mental health services and I have seen firsthand how it's failing our youth. My 25-year-old son, German, has struggled with depression. During the pandemic, things got worse because he was isolated, wasn't socializing, and was in his bathroom all day. He stopped taking proper care of himself, and that worried me. There is nothing worse for a mother than to see her child not want to socialize and have suicidal thoughts. I tried to get help, but Nevada doesn't have enough mental health resources. I would try to make appointments for him, but openings were always a month out. He has to wait for a long time to get seen by a professional, which is hard because my son needs help urgently. My son is a bright student, but, but when he lost interest in things, he lost it all. The Nevada legislature needs to fund more youth mental health resources. We need more mental health professionals in Nevada and early detection programs in school, infrastructure to help children and adults, education on, and education on how mental health impacts families and our society. I am here today asking that you do something to help so that more mothers don't have to know this feeling. I urge the Nevada legislature to support the path AJR5. Thank you. Thank you. Next person who would like to testify in support. Hi, my name is Dina Virgil, DEA, NNA, VIR, GIL. I work in the uniforms control on the Las Vegas Strip and have been a culinary union member since 1985. My 17-year-old granddaughter suffers from depression and anxiety. She has had suicidal thoughts. She has been in the hospital because of her anxiety and depression. My son has tried to get her help by taking her to see a therapist, but it's not easy because a lot of the therapist offices have long waiting lists. There were a couple of therapists that she did see but could not identify with them because they were older than her and she felt that they couldn't relate to what she was going through as a teenager. There needs to be more youth health, mental health resources and education, more psychologists and counselors in schools who can handle the issues that are going on in teenagers' lives. And there needs to be more mental health professionals and infrastructure in Nevada. I don't want to see my granddaughter get thrown away. I support AJR5 and ask the Nevada legislator, legislature to support this bill as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Bedoya, M-I-R-E-A-B-E-D-O-L-L-A. I am Las Vegas Strip Guest Room Attendant and Culinary Union Member Science uh, 2007. I'm here to support AGR5. I have children, I have two children, a son and daughter. My son started suffering from depression in 2020 after the pandemic started. During the pandemic, he was 16 years old at the time. He told me he needs help because he feels depressed. I take him to, to see a, a psychologist. Before his appointment, he, wa he had written down how he was feeling, that he wanted to kill himself as a mother. I don't even imagine my son was going through that. 
and I broke my heart. When the Green Hill Insurance I had from my union job, my son was able to get therapy once a month. But because there are no enough psychologists in Nevada, he was not able to get seen from one or two months out. After his mental health illness started to impact his life, he was behind in the last two years of high school, and he, there, he didn't graduate. He's, he's doing better now. Last year, he got his GED, and he's now taking college classes. Also, I have a daughter who started to suffer from panic attacks and at 14 years old, when the pandemic first hit, she doesn't like to be around a lot of people. Things got so bad that I had to take her to the emergency room three times in different, three different times in the same week because she kept having severe panic attacks. Our kids need more mental health resources. Please help us. And I support AGR5 and ask to, and ask, and ask to the Nevada leaders to support this bill. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bethany Kahn and I'm here on behalf of the Culinary Union in today, today in support of AJR5. As one of the largest organizations of parents in Nevada, the Culinary Union believes it's imperative that Nevada lawmakers address our mental health care system. Our union has a long history of fighting and winning for working families in Carson City. We've taken on Big Pharma to win diabetes and asthma drug transparency and worked for over 25 years to end surprise medical bills for all Nevadans. And this year is no different. We continue to fiercely advocate for workers and Nevadans to have quality health care and neighborhood stability. One job should be enough to have a roof over our heads and to ensure Nevada's youth have quality mental health care access and education. And just like we've done throughout our 88-year history in Nevada, the Culinary Union will stand together and win a future where we all thrive. The Culinary Union applauds Assemblyman Miller's efforts to bring forward an amendment to the Nevada Constitution that would pave the way for Nevada to establish a state lottery in order to provide critical funding. And we urge the Nevada legislature to invest in Nevadans and our youth by passing the amendment to the Nevada Constitution. Thank you. Uh, hello again. My name is Melanie Arizmendi, M-E-L-A-N-I-E-A-R-I-Z-M-E-N-D-I, and I'm in support of AJR5. In 2021, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Ch Children's Hospital Association together declared a national state of emergency in children's mental health and the U.S. Surgeon General issued an advisory calling on the country to address the youth mental health crisis urgently. The pandemic only exacerbated the situation. Youth mental health is now parents' biggest concern, and 40% said in a recent national poll that they are extremely or very worried that their kids struggle with anxiety or depression. Yeah, young, young people are in crisis as teen girls reported high rates of sadness and suicidal violence. We must do something. In Nevada, the numbers are stark. Nevada public schools are the most poorly funded in, US, in the US, according to a 2022 study by the Education Law Center. Nevada funds its students $4,370 less per pupil than the national average of $15,446. The study found giving it a ranking of 47th in the funding level. In 2021 and 2022, Mental Health America ranked Nevada as the worst in the nation for overall mental health based on the prevalence of mental illness and access to care. Now, Nevada received a D-plus on the Children's Mental Health Report Card and Fs for access to mental behavioral care, adolescent substance abuse, substance use disorders, emotional disturbance, and juvenile justice. This has to change. Please support and pass AJR5. Thank you. My name is Amala Zoya and I support of AJR5. In the first year of COVID-19 pandemic, global prevalence of anxiety and depression increased by massive 25% according to the World Health Organization. Nevada's mental health system has been underfunded for decades and has been the worst in the nation for years. It is particularly bad for Nevada's children. While there are already concerns about youth mental health prior to the pandemic, the past two years have exposed children and adolescents to un unprecedented events and a general sense of unpredictability in their lives. As a mother, I urge NV Ledge to support and pass AJR5. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Aria Flores, A-R-I-A-F-L-O-R-E-S, and I am here in a personal capacity. Uh, being born and raised in Las Vegas, I remember as a child, my parents would often hear from loved ones in California that the mega was up to an astronomical amount, and my parents would make a fun little day trip to Prim, Nevada, with a mere hope of possibly winning the lottery. As I became an adult, it also became my hope. Eventually, one gets tired of being stuck in traffic on the way to Prim, especially as Tropicana is closed. Our fellow Nevadans have had enough, and they've said it time and time again. Let AJR5 be put to a vote for our fellow Nevadans. AJR5 would also increase govern government revenue, create jobs, and encourage responsible gambling. Responsible gambling in, when, in which one does not have to sit hours and hours upon on one of those comfy chairs, but I'm not sure which is more comfy or yours, or the, cas the casino chairs. This brings hope to Nevada, and personally, this gives me hope to not sit in one more car ride with my parents, questioning every life decision. Give me a chance of hope, and give Nevadans a chance of, to vote on this. Lastly, just as cannabis has helped our education, let the lottery help our mental health. I encourage you to support AJR5. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there any more testimony in Las Vegas in support of AGR 5? Okay, seeing none, broadcasting will go to the telephones. To testify in support of AJR 5, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Garlow and members of the committee. My name is Russ James. I am with the Nevada AFL-CIO and a longtime member of the Painters and Allied Trades. I strongly support Assembly Joint Resolution 5, and I urge the committee to support it as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. -E -E and I'm the Policy Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada here in support of Assembly Joint Resolution 5. First, as someone who has dealt with mental health issues myself, I really want to thank Assemblyman Miller for sharing his personal experience in this presentation and helping to reduce the stigma associated with it. AGR5 would allow Nevada voters to authorize a state lottery to fund important state services like youth mental health care. In a 2022 report from Mental Health America, Nevada ranked 51st in youth mental health, having the highest prevalence of mental illness in relationship to access to care in the state. This is just unacceptable. And while we were able to make some recent investments with federal COVID relief dollars, those funding sources are not sustainable or long-term. Nevada has long been the epicenter of gambling and casinos in the nation, Yet in my five years in the state, I've only spent $20 at a casino at the behest of my out-of-state friends excited to be visiting. I lost that money and really have no desire to ever do so again. However, I have and would be willing to purchase a lottery ticket despite the slim chances of winning because I know that rather than benefiting a corporation's profit margin, my loss would have gone to a good cause. I urge your support of AJR5 to let Nevada voters decide the future of Nevada's lottery. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Gorlor and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Deanna Levis, L-E-I-V-A-S. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 711, which represents about 7,000 members and their families. I strongly urge the committee to support AJR5, we have to deal with the mental health crisis in Nevada, and we need revenue to accomplish this. Establishing a state lottery seems to be the best way to get this done. Please support Nevadans. So support NJR5. Thank you very much. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Gorlow and members of the committee. My name is Cody Hawkins. I'm the political director for SCIU Local 1107, representing over 11,000 nurses and healthcare professionals. SCIU is, is here in support of H AJR 5 today. AJR 5 will lead to a well-needed investment in our mental health care and education system. Nevada continues to rank at or near the bottom in education and mental health care funding. 
AGR05 will create an additional revenue stream that we could use that we can now use to ensure Nevada students and children get the education and mental health care they deserve. We urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Good evening, Chairwoman Gordo and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Liz Sorensen. I am the president of the Nevada State AFL-CIO, and I'm here today in support of AJR5, and I strongly urge this committee to also support Assembly Joint Resolution 5 as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Hi, good evening. Alexander Mark of the Nevada State Education Association in support of AGR5 to establish a state lottery. Uh, we're in support, especially when funds would go to youth mental health and education. In response to the governor's budget, NSCA has been asking now what quite a bit. Um, in future fiscal years, Nevada is unlikely to have record revenues that we've seen in recent years. So it's uh, still necessary to pursue various streams of revenue uh, for education and other critical services. Uh, just today, we heard measures for this, the state lottery, a study for a wealth tax, and a measure for a digital sales tax. Those are the sorts of bold actions we've been talking about all session and the types of actions that the Commission on School Funding has said Nevada needs to take. Um, Nevada should be doing all it can in terms of bringing in new revenue, so we urge your support on Assembly Joint Resolution 5. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Gorlo and the members of the committee. For the record, my name is Robert Sumlin, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-U-M-L-I-N, and I'm with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local Lodge SC711 in Las Vegas, Nevada. Due to the widespread middle crisis in our state, it is vital that the committee supports this resolution to establish a state lottery and create permanent revenue stream to strengthen Nevada's mental health services. I strongly urge the committee to support Assembly Joint Resolution 5. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. If you have recently joined and would like to testify in support of AJR5, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no other callers to testify in support at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. We'll then move into opposition in Carson City. Please come up to the table. It's two minutes each. Don't forget to press the microphone and state and spell your name for the record. And whoever wants to go first may begin when ready. Good evening. <laughs> Chairwoman and committee, my name is Lynn Chapman, and I'm the uh, state treasurer of the Independent American Party. Did you know that there is a Teen Gamblers Anonymous? Our children are gambling at increasing numbers, and they're becoming addicted to gambling. In the McGill University study, adult problem gamblers reported that children, their parents, uh, that as children, their parents purchased lottery tickets or took them to play bingo. Some of them were gambling between the ages of 10 to 19 years old. Problematic gambling among adolescents has been linked with increased delinquency and criminal behavior, as well as the disruption of family and peer relationships. It can also neg negatively affect school performance and work performance. Money is not the only reason why children gamble excessively. Adolescents with serious gambling problems reported that nothing else mattered and that they were able to forget about their problems. The higher per capita spending on the lottery is among those who have not completed high school, with high school dropouts spending almost four times as much gambling annually as college graduates. <coughs> What's the dropout rate here in Nevada? The cost to families is very high. One study shows between a quarter and one half of the spouses and at least one in 10 children of compulsive gamblers have been victims of abuse. Divorce rates are much higher as well. At what cost to our families, especially the children, will the lotteries bring? What costs? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Chair Gorlow, members of the committee, Nick, Vas Nick Vasiliadis here for the record on behalf of the Nevada Resort Association in opposition to AJR5. Uh, before our president and CEO, Virginia Valentine, uh, speaks more directly to our opposition, I'd like to take a moment to set the table in terms of where the industry is actually coming from. I think it's safe to say that there's no place in the world like, like Nevada. 
I think it's equally safe to say that the tourism and hospitality industry is primarily driven and fueled by the gaming industry is, is the reason why. And that didn't happen on accident. When statewide regulators first were formalized, it was a deliberate idea that to operate gaming in this state was a privilege. And that privilege came with a responsibility, you could even call it a burden, that the, or an obligation, not a burden, sorry, an obligation to uh, create a, an industry that has an economic impact greater than simple revenues alone. The lottery doesn't meet that standard. And I think that the importance of our brick and mortar establishments can never be overvalued. Those are construction jobs. Those are servants and maintenance jobs. Those are operation jobs. There are support industries that pop up all around these cities to support directly gaming, tourism, hospitality, but also the support industries that popped up just to uh, meet the demand of cities that rapidly grew around an industry that is first in the world. With so many unknowns, and I think you've heard a lot of that today, a lot with speculation, and, that, and that's okay, I'm not criticizing anybody, but before we do something that could potentially have an impact on the state's largest industry, the state's largest revenue driver, maybe we should take a step back and have a real honest conversation about what the impacts are. Because despite everything that you've heard today, nothing in this piece of legislation actually directs any money to mental health. And I think it would be a misrepresentation to say that the industry stands in the way of supporting mental health. There's over hundreds of millions of dollars in the state budget right now that you guys could actually utilize to fund mental health today. We wouldn't have to wait six years. And so I think the fundamental difference between Nevada and the gaming industry in Nevada and gaming industries and lotteries in every other state is this one undeniable fact. When gaming loses, Nevada loses. And that's not true anywhere else. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Please go ahead when ready. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Virginia Valentine, and I'm representing the Nevada Resort Association in opposition to AJR5 today. Authorizing the state lottery is a pretty simple idea. The majority of other states have one. Why not Nevada? The answer is that Nevada is not like any other state, with an economy that is so dependent on its gaming and tourism industry. Gaming was legalized more than 90 years ago today, and today we are a global tourism destination with gaming and tourism that generates an annual economic impact of over $90 billion and contributes more than 35% of the state's general fund revenue. As the state's largest industry, tourism is responsible for more than 386,000 jobs statewide, or 27% of the state's total employment. The legislature's historically strategic and disciplined approach to policy making for gaming, tourism, and economic development has established Nevada as the world's entertainment capital, drawing millions of visitors, not only for gaming, but for additional experiences that have resulted from decades of investment. In contrast, lotteries are fundamentally distinct and different from the state's traditional approach to gaming. Lotteries are not a part of an economic development strategy. They do not create jobs. They do not grow Nevada's workforce. They do not increase overall economic input or result in capital investment. Based on other states' experiences, lotteries do not typically generate the revenue anticipated once the administrative cost costs are factored into the bottom line. And as a small state, Nevada will be at a significant disadvantage in multi-state lotteries where revenue is divided amongst more populous states. Unlike other states with the creation of a lottery, the state would be in direct competition for gaming dollars with its largest single employer and largest single source of private investment. The last time this idea came up was more than a decade ago. It was rejected by policymakers multiple times. Before the state starts to process the authority <coughs> to create a lottery and generate a speculative amount of revenue under a structure yet to be decided by future legislatures, the idea deserves a thorough vetting to understand how it will impact the, late, the state's largest source of economic activity jobs and tax revenues. We know it will have an impact. We just don't know how much. Before I leave, I do want to thank the speaker and the sponsor both for reaching out. Thank you very much. Please go ahead when ready. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Chairwoman Gorlow and members of the committee. For the record, Aaron Midby, Vice President of Government Affairs for Boyd Gaming Corporation. Boyd Gaming is opposed to AJR5, but I would like to thank the sponsor for his willingness um, and invitation and time to meet with us. I really greatly appreciate that. As Ms. Valentine indicated, Nevada is unique and unlike any other state with a lottery in that we are the only state in the nation that is dependent on the gaming industry. We provide 35% of the state's general fund and 27% of the state's jobs. As we saw during the COVID pandemic when gaming establishments were closed for 78 days, Nevada's economy suffered and this body had to make some severe budget cuts in response. Boyd Gaming operates in 10 other states. In all of those states, other states have a lottery. 
The difference is, in many of the states, the lottery was the precursor to gaming, as states realize that commercialized gaming provides a lot more capital investment, infrastructure, and jobs to communities than does the lottery. The other distinction is those economies are more diverse, and gaming in those states is limited to a certain number of licensees who have a guaranteed market share, unlike in Nevada where we have thousands of gaming licensees. Having a lottery in Nevada would essentially be undiversifying our economy. As we have heard in testimony, the goal of the proponents is for Nevada to join a multi-state lottery. The challenge with that is that revenues generated for multi-state lotteries are divided among the participating states based on various factors, such as ticket sales. As a very small state, Nevada would be competing with other larger, more populous states like New York, California, and others, and Nevada's share of the revenue would be very small. So while it may seem as though we are currently giving money away to California and Arizona when Nevada's, Nevadans drive to the border to purchase Powerball tickets, that is not the case. We would simply be exporting dollars to other states, dollars that would normally remain in Nevada as gaming revenue or as purchasing power for other local sales and services. Passage of AGR 5 would remove the provision from the state constitution that prohibits a lottery in the state of Nevada. Removing this pro protection creates a slippery slope with many unanswered questions. While the structure and governance has not yet been determined and it may be limited to start, it will only take a simple majority vote to expand the lottery in future sessions. In other states where we operate, the lottery is expanded to online lottery, sports betting, video lottery terminals, or VLTs, and keeps snowballing from there. AGR 5 is a great risk to take when the impacts to the gaming industry, the state's largest taxpayer and revenue generator, are not fully known. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Andrew Diss. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Morello Gaming. Um, we're here in opposition to AGR 5. We started this hearing today talking about the reasons why we have a prohibition against lottery in our state constitution. And the language directly from the Legislative Council's Digest says, such constitutional provisions prohibiting lobbies were intended to protect the public from harm caused by lottery operators that were prevalent in our nation's early history that were plagued by fraud, corruption, mismanagement, and abuse. And I would argue we're still in the same position today. When you go online and you search for stories about lottery operators all across this country, you see example after example of fraud and mismanagement that is occurring in other states. A uh, recent example is the security officer for the Multi-State Lottery Association, which is basically the regulatory body behind Powerball. Um, they inserted code into uh, different lottery games where it allowed him to know what numbers were going to be drawn three times throughout every year. This scheme was going on for five to six years, and he was sharing those numbers with friends and friends of friends in order to get a piece of the winnings. Um, that was discovered. It was investigated. He pled guilty uh, just a couple of years ago. He is now serving 25 years in prison. 25 years. It's a long time. Example after example, you'll see um, Arizona, Illinois, New York state lottery directors are contributing to this uh, public fraud that's going on. Um, the other issue I wanted to bring up, it, Mr. DeLong uh, touched on it earlier. So section 24 Section 2, sub A, the language says the legislature shall not pass any laws which grant a special charter to any person or other entity to operate a lottery or sell lottery tickets. Now, I, I appreciate the invitation from the sponsor to take part in how we're going to set this up, but that language specifically prohibits our industry from being a partner when we set this up. Uh, so un unless this language is changed, asking us to come to the table to set up an activity that the state is going to operate in direct competition with our companies, we just have a hard time with that. So thank you for your time, Madam Chair. Thank you. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Cami Dempsey, representing Golden Entertainment. Thank you again for the time and allowing us this opportunity. I don't want to be redundant to some of the things that have been brought up, but I do think there's interesting points that have been um, highlighted. I mean, we've heard a lot of gold standard um, every other state that's doing things. There used to be a time where Nevada was so unique that we didn't compare ourselves to other states because we were different, because we established gaming and we had that bricks and mortar and we were creating jobs and we were developing revenues for our state to not have an income tax because of the structure that exists. And now we're attempting to be just like every other state. Um, we know that mental health is a serious issue. I don't want to downplay that at all. I think we heard from a lot of people that understand and know that it's probably only getting worse, but pro we probably need those dollars now. But in the millions of dollars that we're talking about, 
that go towards gaming right now and bricks and mortar and providing jobs and um, providing the benefits that we all receive, I think this is something to really consider and be important as you evaluate this legislation. Um, one of the points earlier is the state, and I think um, Andrew just mentioned it, as well as Nick, Vis Nick Vassiliadis, is that the state would be competing with private sector. The devil is in the details, and I think this is one of those issues where we don't want to rush this too much because how the structure is and how the state's going to facilitate this and go into competition with private sector really will direct what's going to happen in the future. So thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Please go ahead when ready. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee, Paul Moratkin with the Vegas Chamber. First, I would like to thank the bill sponsor for, me for meeting with the Chamber about this issue. In regards to HR 5, the Chamber is in opposition to repeal the, the prohibition of lotteries to the state constitution for several reasons. From a procedural process, the Chamber's Government Affairs Committee is always leery about amending the state constitution. We believe that any amendment to the state constitution is a serious matter and should be based on expansive and thoughtful conversations before moving any proposal forward. In regard to the policy at hand, we see this repeal of the lottery prohibition as economic, economic deterrent. We believe that this amendment to the Constitution could negatively impact small businesses in our community. As many of you know, the Chamber has 70 industry sectors and 84% of our membership is defined as a small business. Many of those sectors do direct and indirect business with our gaming industry. Gaming and business in our community in Nevada are intertwined together. That is why the Chamber is concerned with that the repeal of the lottery prohibition would have a negative impact on our small business. If a state lottery diverts revenue from the gaming industry, we believe that there would be less demand for vendors, suppliers, and contracts from Nevada's private sector, which means less jobs and will have impact on our neighbors, our families, and your constituents. We also do not believe that state lottery will create jobs to support economic development efforts within the gaming industry. Our gaming industry have been good community partners for decades. They invest back in our community through taxes at the local and state level, committee and social engagement programs, through their foundations, donations, and contributions to numerous nonprofits and charities throughout our state. They do the right thing. We do appreciate the intent to help potentially determine a new revenue line to support social service issues in our state, for example, through future legislation. However, the Chamber's leadership does not believe AGR 5 is the solution. We urge this committee not to move this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anybody else in Carson City who would like to testify in opposition? Hey, seeing none, we will move to Las Vegas. Is there anybody in Las Vegas who would like to come to the table in opposition of AJR 5? Okay, seeing none, broadcasting. Is there anyone on the telephone? To testify in opposition to AJR 5, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good evening, Chairman Gorlo. My name is Barry Lieberman, B-A-R-R-Y-L-I-E-B-E-R-M-A-N. I'm an attorney uh, employed at the South Point Hotel and Casino, and I'm here to speak against in opposition to AJR 5. Uh, I want to say that um, I appreciate the sponsors reaching out to the industry. He has been very good about talking with us, but clearly we have a fundamental disagreement on the effect of a lottery. And I would be remiss if I didn't say to the committee that just last night at the Atlantis Casino, uh, Megabucks was hit for a life-changing $14 million jackpot. And the person who played that spent $10 on it. So while people may get frustrated there is no lottery, there are the opportunities here for life-changing events within the current system. The establishment of a lottery will essentially create a, a, a competitor to the gaming industry. Licensed, non-restricted casinos in the state pay hundreds of millions of dollars in gaming taxes and are the largest employer in the state. Lotteries provide almost no employment and will divert gaming revenue from existing brick-and-mortar casino operations. A lottery would compete for the same gaming dollar as the state existing gaming operators. With respect to the mental health issue, it is absolutely a concern, and, and no one from the gaming industry minimizes that. But there are resources 
that the state has now, and it's up to the governor and the legislature to allocate where funds should go. And I might also add that Mr. Gone, who basically owns the South Point, provides very affordable insurance to his employees, and that includes mental health services for the employees and their dependents. In summary, this is a bad resolution. We are a state that was established on bricks and mortar casinos and the investments necessary for that. And to create a lottery or create a potential for a lottery would not be good for the state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller, please. Hello, my name is Peter Guzman, and I am the president of the Latin Chamber of Commerce. Lotteries are well documented for being extremely regressive and prey on those in our communities who can least afford to lose their hard-earned money. The University of Maryland recently released an in-depth and exhaustive investigative study from its Howard Center for Investigative Journalism on adverse impacts of state lotteries. The study, called Mega Billions, the Great Lottery Wealth Transfer, conducted a first-of-its-kind an analysis of mobile phone location data to prove that the majority of customers come from neighborhoods that are disproportionately home to Hispanic, Black, and lower-income people. I have submitted the study to the committee as an exhibit. The study found that stores in the vast majority of the states that sell lottery tickets are disproportionately concentrated in communities with lower levels of education and income and higher poverty rates with larger populations of people of color. The Latin Chamber of Commerce has serious concerns with the impact of lotteries on our community and encourages this legislation to not move forward because in our opinion, this is nothing more than a tax on low-income and poverty-stricken folks. It's just another low-income tax. Thank you very much. Broadcasting, next caller, please. If you have recently joined and would like to testify in opposition to AJR5, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no other callers to testify in opposition at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. Hey, Assemblyman Miller, did you want to come up to the table for some? Oh, neutral. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Carson City, come up in neutral, please. Good evening. <laughs> Tanya Brown, spelled T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N. I'm coming in as a concerned citizen. I support the bill. However, I have some concerns about it, and as a concerned citizen, I'll, I will tell you the, okay, the reasons. Then we were going to do your testimony in opposition, because neutral is you don't want it to oh. change either way. If you have any changes, even if you love the concept, but you've got to change, you come in neutral or in opposition. So if you have some changes, okay. It's okay. Well, the committee, some of the committees are a little bit different, but okay. That's okay. I, okay, fine. I'll come okay. in in, uh, in opposition. We'll but I'm still in opposition. Okay. Okay. Um, my concerns are this as a concerned um, citizen, and not just mine, but there's been talk with throughout the rural count counties that they get the short end of the stick. And I'm saying that if this should pass, um, we would like to see, or I would like to see, th um, the language defined in, should it go to the vote of the people, to define where that money is going to be used, what percentage of that money is going to be uh, set aside for mental illness, education, and possibly Gamblers Anonymous, because that too is an addiction. Um, and then we'd also like to see, because of the short end of the stick, normally Clark County, uh, and Washoe County get a lot of the money is allocated to those counties. If the winner of a lottery happens to be in a rural county, then set aside, and that should be in the language as well, 20% or 10% of that money is to go back into that county in which the winning ticket was held or, or sold and then dispersed throughout the state. Also, I bring this up because um, I've actually had to go and look at the intent of the legislation on what the bill was. And I want this in there as part of the intent and the record. And like I said, I had to go back to 1973 on a different bill to see what the original intent of the legislators were in a f bill 30 years later. And so um, I'm in op I'm testifying in opposition. I do support it. And another thing, 
I do not gamble. I haven't gambled in years, but I certainly would buy a lottery ticket, and I can give you a dozen people who do not gamble, but they definitely would go and do go into casinos, would buy a lottery ticket in a casino or in a store. That's the way we gamble. We don't gamble with the slots, poker, but a lottery ticket, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. We will go back to neutral testimony in Carson City. Is anyone who'd like to come to the table in, in neutral? Okay, seeing none. Las Vegas, is there anyone who would like to come to the table in neutral? Seeing none. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the telephone who would like to testify in neutral? If you testify in neutral for AJR5, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. B-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. Well, I support the idea of a lottery. I would only support it if other taxes, especially sales taxes, would be lowered. And keep in mind, it was the major Las Vegas resorts that were opposing to Indian gaming several decades ago. Well, we saw how that turned out. We've heard many promises before. We need to raise sales taxes. We need marijuana money, the commerce tax, mining taxes, to raise money for education. It's, it, it's going to work. It's promising it's going to happen. It's going to improve test scores. But year after year, look where we are now. And a lot of money has been wasted. Not to mention, many people are really talking about mental health as a result of this pandemic. But many of these organizations haven't told us. Did these lockdowns, mask mandates, vaccines actually work? Because we like to know the whole enchilada of the problem, the roots of everything that it's causing. So I urge you all to think twice about this bill and make some changes. Yield my time. Thank you very much for your testimony. We will be reclassifying that as opposition. Broadcasting, do we have anybody else who would like to testify in neutral, which means you have no position really on the bill. You're not for it or against it. Chair, there are no other callers to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. Assemblyman Miller, would you like to come to the table, please? Thank you. Go ahead when you're ready. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, just in um, in um, response to some of the testimony that we heard, I don't want to um, go into too many things, but I welcome our gaming partners to do something to fund mental health today. That problem could be solved by them today. Right now, they could create a fund, they could create something that would help us in the immediate future to start addressing the issue. It would still leave us with bringing the lottery to a vote of the people of Nevada. This is not a fast moving process. This is not going to be done without consideration and careful slow walking because there are a number of years before we are able to put a lottery into effect in this state. So we can do it with all the caution and care and consideration that our partners would need to make sure that their businesses are not um, negatively impacted. Um, so with that being said, um, as long as we're still where we are, we're still um, needing to get this past this particular legislature and another legislature to go to the people um, to vote on whether or not they want a state lottery in Nevada. And so with that, I believe Chair has um, had someone come to answer some questions uh, for the committee. So I'll pass that on. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and you may begin when ready. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Kevin Powers, General Counsel, LCB Legal Division. Uh, the reason I'm before you today is I've done extensive research on this lottery issue, and there were some legal issues that came up during the testimony with regard to the provisions dealing with special charters that I believe the LCB Legal Division can provide further clarification for the committee. And just as a reminder to the public, the LCB Legal Division does not support or oppose any particular piece of legislation, viewpoint, or policy. We do, however, provide the legislature and its members with objective legal analysis and advice on issues of law, and in this case, this is an issue of law. To understand what a special charter is, it's a term of art. And it was, a special charter was used generally from the colonial period to the mid-1800s to grant exclusive rights to particular companies to operate a lottery for the benefit of that company, usually for a public improvement. For example, the legislature would pass a special law granting a charter to a company to build a road, and that special charter would include the right to conduct the lottery to generate revenue to build that road. It was a contract through the legislation with that individual company. It wasn't a general law administered by the state, but it was a special privilege to that company, the special charter, to operate the lottery exclusively, essentially as a monopoly for that particular reason. The provision in the Constitution is to ensure that the legislature doesn't pass those types of laws granting individual companies special charters to operate a lottery. However, it does not prohibit the legislature from passing a general law that authorizes a state agency to administer a lottery either through a state agency operating the lottery or through a state agency putting out a bid for a contract for someone else to operate the lottery. The legislature could also pass a general law authorizing private entities to sell lottery tickets. It just couldn't gra grant to those private entities that special charter. For example, the legislature could pass a special law authorizing all casinos that meet certain requirements to sell lottery tickets. The legislature just couldn't grant a special charter to a single casino to sell lottery tickets to exclusive right of against all other casinos. So the point of this is to protect against those chartered lotteries that caused the problems in the colonial period and through the mid-1800s. This prohibits those chartered lotteries. However, the legislature through general law would have the power to enact laws that regulate lotteries through general legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm certainly open to any questions. Thank you very much. It looks like uh, Speaker Yeager does have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I never uh, miss an opportunity to ask Mr. Powers a question when he's here. Um, so I think part of the testimony that Assemblyman Miller gave today was, you know, throughout this process of coming up with potentially enabling legislation that would come to a next session, his intent was to work with stakeholders and organizations on that legislation. Just would like your legal opinion whether that anything in the bill would preclude that kind of work from happening leading up to the drafting and passage of legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. And the answer would be there's nothing in this proposed joint resolution which would become a constitutional provision that would prevent the legislature if it had the power to work with stakeholders to come up with general legislation that regulates the law lottery. As long as it's general legislation that sets standards for a state agency to either operate the lottery or to contract out the operation of the lottery to other entities or to authorize the sale of lottery tickets through multi-state lotteries. All of that is general legislation. They just couldn't grant that, the legislature couldn't grant that special privilege or that special charter which legislatures used to do in the colonial period through the mid 1800s. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming to the table. Okay. And with that, we will close the hearing on AJR 5. But wait, we have public testimony. <laughs> yeah, you want to stay for public testimony? <laughs> If anyone would like to come to the table in Carson City for public testimony, please come now. Each person has two minutes. Okay, I don't see anyone running to the table, so we will go to Las Vegas. Las Vegas, would anyone like to testify for a public comment? Give public comment, not testify. Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the phones. Broadcasting, is there anyone 
on the phones who would like to give public comment. If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good evening, everyone. C-Y-R-E-S, H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. There was uh, plenty of talk in the, in the floor and in the county commission about celebrating Arab History Month. And we've heard how the White House wants to have a declaration for MENA folks, Middle Eastern, North African, which includes Persian people like myself. However, in the state of Nevada, I have not heard one elected official talk about Persian New Year, which happened a few days ago. It's important that we celebrate the cultural impact of every single ethnic group. And if you want to celebrate diversity, you cannot just pick and choose certain cultures. I do support my heritage and my cultural roots, and I like to, you know, further on talk about how the Persians have been invaded by Arabs many, many times. And despite the fact that I like my cultural roots, I think we should have our own history month. I also believe that my cultural roots is not against European Americans and their cultural impact as we have seen the, the cultural influences revealed in the Las Vegas Strip with all the strip casinos, Caesars Palace, Bellagio, Excalibur, and so forth. And I also believe men should have their own history month. But other than that, I hope you think twice, and I will yield my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hajati. Broadcasting, is there anyone else on the telephone who would like to um, provide com public comment? Chair, there are no callers choosing to provide public comment at this time. Thank you very much. It's been a long evening. I appreciate everyone for staying. And with that, we will see you on Thursday at 4 o'clock. We are adjourned.